Well, good morning. Welcome to the August 26th, 2022 meeting of the General Obligation Bond Arts and Culture Subcommittee. We have interpreters today for our Spanish speaking participants and would you please introduce yourselves? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, my name is Mario Barajas and together with my colleague, Carmen Cota, we will both be serving as today's Spanish interpreters. I'll now introduce myself to our Spanish speaking audience. Muy buenos días, mi nombre es Mario Barajas y junto con mi colega Carmen Cota estaremos sirviéndoles como intérpretes del habla hispana. Les pedimos como favor si es que van a estar dando un comentario público, si pueden hablar lentamente, con claridad y evitar de distracciones de fondo. De esa manera vamos a poder interpretarles de la mejor manera posible. Gracias. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I want to say good morning to the members of the subcommittee, staff, and uh, just recognize that our vice chair, Taniqua uh, Broughton, is not yet with us. She will be joining virtually, and we will recognize her as soon as we uh, see her come through. Well, before we move into the agenda items, I wanted to provide a couple of remarks on public comment. There will be a public comment period during item number three of today's agenda. The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits committee members to listen to the comments, but prohibits members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. I'm planning to reserve at least 30 minutes for public comments, uh, but I will decide the duration and the time limit based on the number of speakers we have signed up to speak either virtually or in person today. If you are attending in person and would like to speak, You'll need to sign up at the kiosk located at the entrance to our council chambers here before item number three begins. If you're attending virtually or watching a recording, would like to speak at a future GEO bond uh, subcommittee meeting, you'll need to remember to register at least two hours prior to the start of the meeting, and you may register to speak at phoenix.gov slash bond slash meetings. All right, we will move right into our meeting agenda. Item number one are the, uh, are, excuse me, is the approval of minutes from our last meeting. Uh, just need to note one correction that Mr. Mark Metis from the Herberger Theater Center uh, did request funding for a new pavilion stage, which is that outdoor pavilion stage and not for reha rehabilitation of the facility. So with that correction, may I have a motion for approval? Make the motion for approval. Wonderful. Second. Second, any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent, moving right along. Agenda item number two, introductory remarks. And as I think we all know that uh, during this meeting we'll be going over follow-up items from our first meeting. So as uh, we recall as members of the subcommittee, we did receive presentations on the prioritized items at our first meeting, which was two weeks ago. We also received public comment, had uh, some new projects presented to us during that public comment period. We asked for more information on many of those uh, new ideas as well as some follow-up information on existing prioritized items or uh, an item that's identified as a future need through the, the critical needs study. So today we'll be receiving presentations on uh, those requests from staff. Just want to say thank you again to staff. I know we created uh, or we asked for work from you during the last two weeks. Very important work. Really appreciate all that you have put together for us today. And I'll remember, uh, remind members of our subcommittee that after the presentations, uh, after each one, there will be a Q&A opportunity. And we will also have a representative from the organization um, at the, the podium for us to help answer any questions we may have. Please bring those items forward during this portion of the meeting because as a reminder, again, when we get to public comment, uh, there won't be the opportunity for more questions and discussions at that point. Uh, so again, we will hear presentations today. We will also have the opportunity to ask any questions from our previous meeting, anything that maybe has come to mind since uh, we received that, that first round of presentations. And one final announcement, I would like to share that the city has scheduled a public hearing for the executive committee on September 14th at 6 p.m. And the purposes are to engage the public and hear comments regarding the overall bond program. I do encourage um, all of us on the 
subcommittee to listen to the discussion um, so that we can hear the input received from residents. I will be in attendance as a member of the executive committee, but we are asking that our subcommittee members to watch or attend virtually in order to avoid um, some of the open meeting law requirements. Okay. And lastly, I do want to um, also thank staff, I'm remiss if I do not mention this, for sending the two reports about the Latino Cultural Center project. And I know there's been a discussion um, in, in our conversation at our last meeting and I think also publicly about the location of the, the project. And our job as the subcommittee, I just want to provide some clarification, is to uh, decide if the projects presented to us are worthy of bond funding, knowing that the projects may have changes in scope um, over the funding period. So it's really not for us to uh, determine location at this time, but to, deter to determine if the project is worthy of funding. Any questions before I move us right along? All right. Then we'll head into item number three, capital needs and prioritization and evaluation process. So our next agenda item is uh, for follow-up discussion and public comment regarding capital needs and discussion of the subcommittee's process for prioritizing those capital needs. I will turn it over to staff to share those presentations with us now. Good morning, members of the subcommittee. I'm Mitch Minchaka, Arts and Culture Director. Uh, just wanted to start off comments with our Deputy City Manager, Inger Erickson. Uh, thank you, Mitch, and thank you, uh, members of the subcommittee. Um, I really do appreciate uh, your time. I know that there's going to be lots. Uh, as you can see, we have a full house, it looks like. Um, so that's good to see. There's lots of interest here. Um, but I'm going to let Mitch take it uh, and, and give you the, the good information that he's uh, collected from the various other groups, and we're here to answer any questions. So thank you. All right. At our last subcommittee meeting, we discussed several projects that were identified by the Phoenix Convention Center and the Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture as prioritized capital needs improvements for the proposed $500 million bond. Those projects included the Children's Museum of Phoenix Expansion Project at $1.5 million, the Valley Youth Theater Permanent Home Project at $14 million, the Latino Cultural Center at $21.7 million, the Symphony Hall Theatrical Venue Improvements at $8.6 million, Cultural Facility Critical Maintenance of the Office of Arts and Culture Managed Cultural Facilities at 10 million. As well as we had two projects uh, for future capital needs, including the Arizona Jewish Historical Society's Expansion Project and the Theatrical Improvements at the Herberger Theater Center. We heard from members of the public on proposed ideas for bond funding, and you have requested to learn more about those projects, as well as the Arizona Jewish Historical Society's Expansion Project from the Future Needs List, and an update on the scope of the Children's Museum of Phoenix's project. So today we will discuss these five projects, and we will uh, stop after each project to uh, be able to do some Q&A and not go through all five of them at one sitting, but that will be, again, the Jewish Historical Society's expansion project at two million, the Children's Museum of Phoenix updated project, which comes to a new total of $5.3 million, the Herberger Theater Center's Pavilion Stage project at $4.5 million, the Phoenix Center for the Arts Repair at $8.2 million, uh, and the Phoenix Theater Company ADA project at $5.8 million. We asked each organization to complete a project submittal form and answer a series of questions including that the uh, narratives that the project must not already be covered under the scope of existing projects or programs, discuss if partial funding would be beneficial, and if so, describe how the other funds would be raised. They must have completed a scope and document the source of estimated costs, including operating costs if city impacts uh, were going to uh, occur, and they must demonstrate an urgent need and must demonstrate that the ability to ex uh, expend the approved funding within the five years. Organizations also had to submit backup documentation on the complete scope and submitted source of the estimated costs, including facility assessments, architectural assessments, etc. We will now give high-level overviews of these projects like we did last time with the other projects. So our first one is the Arizona Jewish Historical Society, which preserves and celebrates the rich heritage of Arizona's Jewish communities, educates the public about the Jewish historical experience, including the Holocaust, and promotes awareness of our state's diverse history through arts, culture, and educational program. 
<clears throat> the Society owns and operates the Cutler Plotkin Jewish Heritage Center at 122 East Culver Street. The center is a historic synagogue and church and now serves the community as a museum, cultural center, and event venue. The Historical Society provides museum exhibitions on Jewish history and art, forums and educational events, genealogy programs, and documentary films and book discussions. The Heritage Center was a 2010 point of pride, and the center has a lease agreement with Burton Bar Library for shared parking. The scope of the project is to update and expand the Cutler Plot the Jewish Historical Center to include 17,000 square feet addition of state-of-the-art Holocaust and Human Rights Education Center, a special exhibit gallery, classrooms, collection storage, and event space. The upgrades include new displays, technology, and lighting. The new design will update the existing building while preserving the historical integrity. The center will provide students, teachers, and the communities an opportunity to see, hear, and learn the history and lessons of the Holocaust and its global relevancy. The GO bond request is a little over $2 million. The project is not already covered under the scope of an existing project or program. Partial funding would be beneficial to the project as the project is $18 million and the rest of the funds are being raised by the private sector and donations. Cost estimates came from Gallagher Associates and Shannon Construction, and the project should not be deferred and can be completed in the five-year time period. The project will not require any additional city staff maintenance or service needs. And that is the Arizona Jewish Historical Society's expansion project. Thank you. Members of the subcommittee, do we have any questions? as well as in the audience, a representative from the organization to whom we may address those comments. Excellent. I say address those questions. Hearing no questions, we will move to the next presentation, but again, we'll have time for discussion uh, at the, the conclusion of the presentations. The next project is the Children's Museum of Phoenix, which we discussed in our last meeting. It was founded in 1989 as the Phoenix Family Museum. It's managed by the Office of Arts and Culture and operated by a nonprofit tenant. In 2001, it acquired and renovated the Old Monroe School at 215 North 7th Street. The museum welcomes 300,000 guests annually and offers more than 300 play experiences spread throughout three floors. The scope of the project was to originally additionally add square footage and unusable space by completing four unfinished rooms in the museum. Improvements included structural, HVAC, plumbing, electrical, lighting, room finishes, hazard abatement, and environmental remediation. The project will increase exhibit and programming space to expand the operating capacity to serve more children and families. Completing additional rooms will allow certain exhibits to be relocated from temporary sites to locations more appropriate for interactive exhibits. The, the, original, sorry, the original cost of the department's facility assessment was $1.5 million. Again, the initial project was to renovate and upgrade four vacant rooms. The new scope is an additional seven rooms for a total of 11 rooms that would include the full excavation of the dirt room in the basement, as you see in the images uh, provided. They would add restrooms, do abatement, address ADA issues, and again, environmental remediation. The extra space will allow for more school tours, grow attendance by potentially another 150,000 visitors, and help the museum's financial resiliency. The revised project cost is $5.3 million, adding an additional $3.8 million to the scope. The project is not already covered under the scope of an existing project or program. Partial funding would not be beneficial to the project. However, if full funding were available, then $1 million in tenant improvements could be committed. The cost estimates came from Ryan Company, PK Associates, and MSA Engineering. The project should not be deferred and could be completed in the five-year time period. This project may require city staff maintenance or service needs contingent on the operating agreement between the museum and the Office of Arts and Culture. Thank you. Any questions from members of the subcommittee? Chair. A question from, from me on the, the 
piece about partial funding not being beneficial. Um, given that we had an original cost estimate for a smaller project, and now a revised cost estimate for a larger project, I guess I'm wondering how, you know, partial funding perhaps for the original request would not also be beneficial given that it would accomplish some of the project. So the original was a scope done by the city of Phoenix on four rooms. Um, again, the museum did do an additional assessment of the 11 rooms, which if that assessment had done at the time of the original submissions, we probably would have provided you the higher cost um, project. Thank you. I'm curious too about how much time was given to each of these cultural entities to come up with a budget. Um, how quickly were they asked to respond to the bond um, program request? So those within the Office of Arts and Cultures portfolio and the Phoenix Convention Center, we began working with these organizations in January. We collected this information in time for the capital needs study which I think information was due by uh, March. So we gave them three months to look at these projects and then worked with them along the way. However, some of these assessments done by the tenants on their own, which you'll also hear another project from another tenant, those cost estimates came after staff started pulling together the information to get the kickoff going. So the, the estimates that were made that are the lower estimates are by, made by the city and it, so the project grew from the uh, Children's Museum's point of view. Uh, they wanted more. I mean, I'm surprised that they didn't want the whole shebang at the beginning. I'm just curious about that because I know that that museum has been wanting to renovate the entire lower floor for, you know, since the beginning. So I'm, an, I'm, I'm just curious about why they only wanted four rooms versus the 11. So again, the uh, members of the subcommittee, the original four were done by the assessment um, of the Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture with our public works on some of the larger spaces. The other seven rooms are on the smaller spaces, which we, um, in concert with the museum, um, felt that those were the priority rooms as the landlord. Um, we did, again, give the tenant the opportunity. We're excited to get the information now to be able to present it to you, but just based off of previous conversations with the city, those four rooms were presented in the facility condition assessment of the entire scope of the building that we do on a regular basis of our properties. Just a point of clarity and actually a question as well. So the money that we're working with is the money we're working with. And so as we talk about the increase of funding for these different projects, we got to either pull it from somewhere else or potentially the $10 million that is for um, uh, just anecdotal projects, I believe. Is that right or is that not right? Thank you, uh, subcommittee member. Yes, that's correct. Um, you will be uh, restricted or overall limited to the $500 million bond program. So. Uh, there isn't room to, to expand it, but uh, there is certainly room to have discussion and identify what those priorities are um, from the community. Well, I'm just making the point too, if, since we're kind of beholden to um, the lanes in which we're in on the budget, if, this, if these dollars increase, this actually expands outside our current formula or the weighted for all the dollars that we have allocated to each project, correct? This might be the perfect opportunity to insert a couple of uh, comments and reminders for clarity. So by between now and our fourth meeting, so we only have two more meetings after today's, uh, by the end of our third meeting as a subcommittee, we will want to identify the list of prioritized projects that we want to put forward to the executive committee. By the end of our fourth meeting, we as a subcommittee need to prioritize those prioritized items before we take it to the executive committee. And yes, the amount that has been identified within the prioritized items in the critical needs study, we still need to go to the, we being I, representing the subcommittee, needs to go to the executive committee with our recommendations. And there's still a chance at that point that there could be modifications made to the funding amount, what projects make the final, the final list. Is that, I'm, I'm receiving 
that is correct from That's good. staff leadership. Thank you for that clarity. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. Yes. Just a point of clarification. The, the total amount recommended is over $600 million. The recommendation, because of limitations, uh, limitations uh, by state law, uh, is, is for $500 million. So there is uh, uh, over $100 million that at some point has to be cut. Um, do I understand from your comments just a moment ago that that's not our job, that is the executive committee's job to reduce the amounts to fit into the $500 million or are we going to make dollar amount recommendations? We will make dollar amount recommendations, dollar amount recommendations for each of the prioritized projects that we want to put forward and then that total amount that we're recommending as the subcommittee recommendation. Now, we could recommend more than what is identified in the critical needs study. However, there will be great discussion, I'm sure, at the executive committee meetings regarding your point. Now, which projects make the $500 million in total not to, not to exceed? So well, uh, there could be cuts from what we recommend. Uh, uh, Madam Chairman, in, uh, my point was not whether we could recommend more, but whether it is in our uh, mission to recommend less uh, because obviously $680 million is the total and $500 min million is the limitation. Are we uh, the body that's going to say uh, to uh, the Children's Museum, no, uh, you're only going to get half of that. Uh, to, uh, 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 to the Jewish Cultural Center, you're only getting a million. Uh, and to uh, some other body that I won't mention, you're not getting anything. Are we the persons uh, who are going to do that, or are we merely going to approve those prioritized uh, recommendations that have been handed us and the executive committee, it is their job to reduce the amount. Is that correct? I, I'm understanding your question, I believe, and that is a fantastic question. My understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the projects we recommend need to be completed within the duration of time identified and it's start to finish the cost that we are that if we're recommending a project, the costs associated with it will complete it from start to finish. So it would not behoove us as a subcommittee to recommend partial funding for a project because in the overall process as, as laid out, the project would likely not make the final list if it cannot be completed and have the full funding to be completed in the duration of time assigned. Is that accurate? Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, the executive committee did not provide a funding limit uh, to the subcommittees. And so as you go through the, your decision process, um, you are really tasked with identifying whether there are projects beyond those in the prioritized list that should be included in your ranking uh, methodology. And we'll have time later in this meeting to discuss a framework on how that ranking process might take place um, and perhaps we can dive deeper into some of these questions. Madam Chairman, my question uh, is being evaded here. Are we to serve as an appropriations committee and decide on dollar amounts or merely on those items, prioritize items, we want to recommend and rank uh, to the executive committee? Subcommittee member Gutierrez, uh, there's, there's two questions really when it comes to funding level. There's, there's the question of the funding level for an individual project. The subcommittee is tasked with identifying a recommended funding level for an individual project. The subcommittee is not, uh, has not been directed to identify the overall funding level for the arts and culture projects um, combined. All right. Madam Chairman, I'm, just one last question. So, that's an interesting answer. And the interesting answer is 
that it evades this issue, which is in order to get to that amount, do we just simply send what we get in terms of dollar amounts or are we project by project uh, empowered to reduce or increase that amount? Subcommittee member Gutierrez, uh, th those decisions are at the discretion of the subcommittee. Thank you. Good answer. Took a while. I always appreciate multiple questions within a question. <laughs> uh, I'm really glad that we dug into that. And I do think that our third meeting will be when we really in detail discuss. Um, and also for us to keep in mind when we look at that total $500 million amount and identifying 56 million is assigned to arts and culture in the critical needs study uh, as we strategically think through what we're going to, to, to recommend and, and present. Uh, you know, looking at the percentages assigned and, and having, I think, real discussion around what we think the arts and culture organizations, infrastructure, buildings, et cetera, should receive through this bond program. Uh, so we will have an in-depth discussion at our next meeting. In between today's meeting and our third meeting, if the subcommittee would find it helpful, there is a um, survey tool that staff is willing to provide for us to work through what we think individually should be included and how to prioritize it so that we can gather our thoughts and our numbers prior to our discussion during that third meeting. Um, and they have a presentation on that for us later in the meeting, but hopefully that will help us just be organized and how we're thinking strategically through, through our recommendations. Madam Chair, if I may, that tool too is um, a, a confidential tool. Nobody would know who said what about. So, and again, as we get further into the meeting, we'll discuss that. But just knowing that, it wouldn't be something that anybody would know who, who said what about which project. Madam Chair, I have a, a follow-up actually on the, the Children's Museum expansion. In the vein of understanding where we might need to pare down dollars, just for clarity, um, there are two additional things here. There's a, a million dollar TI contribution, it sounds like, that would come with the five million dollar project. I'm wondering why that would not come with a smaller project. And secondarily, does the original 1.5 million dollar four room project, does that estimate still stand for the four room project rather than, you know, the full 11? Could we say, hey, you know, the four rooms sound like enough to us, for example? So, uh, members of the subcommittee, I will let uh, the Children's Museum answer about the $1 million um, tenant improvement. Um, the 1.5, we would work, whatever the subcommittee, if they were to allocate funds to the Children's Museum, we as the landlord would work with the tenant to identify the needs. There have been some conversations since the assessment that was done by the Children's Museum that that dirt room probably needs to be tackled before anything else can be tackled. So we would probably have to put attention um, to that, that space. And so I have Kate Wells um, from the Children's Museum, happy to answer subcommittee questions from the organization. Do you need the question repeated? No, I just need to figure out how to turn this off. Oh, it's on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think I've done this before. Um, so as to the, um, the tenant improvement, um, those are things that we, in consultation with our construction company, um, assume the city would not pay for as part of the, those are things that we need to do to customize it for our own use. So we would um, um, take on the cost of those things. I mean, if they want to pay for it, great, but we made some assumptions there. Um, the difference between the $1.5 million and the um, $5.3 million, the $5 million um, budget is significant, I understand that. And if I can clarify from our perspective, um, we were asked in the spring to show our four unfinished rooms on our exhibit floors specifically. Um, and we didn't know at that point that it was for the bond. We have city people coming through there all the time looking at different things. So at that point, we did not know it was for consideration for the bond. Um, we had then a few months later, three days to prepare our response to those documents and we did not have any, um, we were, were, were not able to um, give any input on the dollar amount at that point. Um, 
we we did, um, and, and I'm sure Mitch can you know support this. We did make it clear to the city staff that we really needed to renovate the entire building. And part of the challenge um, that we have with the building, and if you're any familiar with it, it's an old historic building. It's three stories, and a number of the rooms, even one of the ones that we, <coughs> excuse me, have accounted for in this four room, it's it's floor is the ceiling of another room and we cannot renovate that room because there's unless we do the structural work in between that room and the room below it um, so when i officially get to speak for my three minutes i'll i'll, I'll refer you to details uh, pr uh, um, presentation that i have for you and details about why all the rooms are so interconnected and it's very difficult for us to pull th four of the rooms out and not do structural HVAC and electrical all at the same time, um, which would impact the other rooms. And that's why it's kind of a bigger proposal and um, it differs from what the city is. And I don't mean to throw the city staff under the bus because they've been amazing. It was just the process was, um, and it was just, you know, from us, a different perspective from our side and our ability to kind of help direct what needed to be done. Does that answer all the questions? Thank you. Actually, just really for clarification, okay. is the Children's Museum willing to provide the, the dollars for TIs regardless of a dollar amount provided by the city? Say that again? So is the Children's Museum willing to pay for the TIs as proposed here regardless of the level of funding provided by the subcommittee? The, the TI would be different if we only received the $1.5 million because we would only be doing four rooms, um, so that number would change. Uh, but we, of course, would be willing to do that, yes. But you say you cannot do the four rooms because of the structural issues, so that's why you've said that f f with only 1.5 million you could not proceed? With the four rooms. One of the rooms um, is attached to what we colloquially call the dirt room, and that needs significant structural um, improvements to be able to use the room that's above it because of the flooring and ceiling issues. Does that make sense? So you, you had three days to come up with a figure? Is that what you said? We didn't come up with a figure. Um, the, 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 the figure from the city came from, I think it was Public Works and sh the Streets Department um, staff. And um, we then had a three days to come up with kind of our, our summary of what we wanted to say about renovating those four rooms. But in and that's what we received initially. But in terms of your scope of work, you didn't say we only want these four rooms done. You were no. told that that was what the, the uh, city thought that you ought to be doing. Right. Initially, we were we we you know they we brought them into the rooms and said these are the four rooms in our exhibit floor is that um, we need to renovate someday and um, and then we um, the number came to us. We didn't have anything to do with making putting the number together and they said well this is the amount that you we would we would propose for those four rooms. And then, and we had just, we had been working on, with Ryan Companies and Peking Engineering for months, just happened, the timing happened to be um, right, that we had this final um, construction budget completed in June, which was well after the city, um, you know, had done their assessment of the four rooms. And our, our assessment um, did the whole entire, um, the, the unfinished and underfinished spaces. Okay, so... It, it, Does that make sense? Yeah, but if you if you had been asked to to give your you know desire for what the bond would cover, it would not have been the four rooms. It would have been the eleven rooms. Correct. Okay. Thank you, and Madam Chair. Um, if if I may, um, again, if we can remember back to the the, we haven't had a bond program in many many years. Sixteen years, I think it has been, and we did large ones that went over a long period of time. The intent now is to. Um, have every five years a, a, a geo bond. So I think um, initially the direction from the city manager um, was to look at things that had been deferred um, versus things that might be new that would then uh, add to staff uh, costs, things of that nature. So I don't think anybody intended to try to not communicate with people. I don't think that was the point. So I just want to make sure we're clear on that. I think it was what the city observed is in their evaluation was one thing, and maybe a desire or need might be something different. So I, I don't want I don't want it to appear that staff wasn't trying to 
um, find the things that the city's facilities needed to have attention to. Um, but again, there was specific direction on how we were to do this. And then the three days or the week that you had to get the information back was as a result of this first meeting. So I, I just want to add clarity there if I can. I have a question too. Are, are you considering the Children's Museum non-renovation of the lower floors to be an ongoing project, that th something that wasn't completed in the previous bond? Because um, the, the structure was not dealt with in the, in the previous, but or is this an ongoing project or is this a new project from your perspective? Um, I'd have to defer to, to Mitch and his team since they're the ones who do the evaluations. But I, again, I just wanted to add that clarity for the team. Yes, and as we mentioned, uh, members of the subcommittee, in the last meeting, these are departmental um, uh, projects. And we had in our assessments those four rooms previous to my ever being at the city of Phoenix uh, in our capital improvements. And so that's what we went through um, as part of our facility conditions with public works um, on those rooms. Um, so again, we looked at our facilities. We looked at what was missing in facility condition assessments, what had been in prioritized projects if we could ever do a bond in the past. And that's how the prioritized list which we probably submitted 16 projects um, when this whole process started. And you saw from last week, we got four in the prioritized projects, one of them being these four rooms from the Children's Museum, which had been ongoing conversations within the city as um, renovations to occur. Um, so we're excited to work with the Children's Museum. We're excited she's here now. We have the full proposal in front of you, and the three days came from this ask of the subcommittee two weeks ago which we've worked with them. We had a meeting with Kate when she had the Ryan information even before this meeting even started. So we're excited to have this information presented to you now. And I didn't mean to make it sound like the staff wasn't doing their job because they're phenomenal. I, it just, the process was four rooms versus, you know, finishing the building, which is the, the 5.3. I didn't but, know all that inside stuff. But the, the four the rooms, was that something that I, I don't know? Is, you're saying that those were something from a previous bond that had not no, been? Not from a bond, just from the landlord's perspective as projects to ta tackle when funding could be available. Okay, and that's something you were aware of, that they were focusing on four rooms? Eventually we were made aware of that. Eventually we were. Yeah. Thank you. But let me just clarify that one of the rooms we can definitely not do within the scope of the 1.5 million because of the room that is connected to it. Um, so I just want to. The dirt room. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll give you floor plans later. Before we move on to the next presentation, if it would be helpful at any time to members of the subcommittee, I do have in front of me uh, the, the general the General Obligation Bond Committee memo from the city manager, and in the overview it does talk about um, the criteria that was used when identifying projects to be included in the critical needs study. It's a couple of paragraphs. I'm happy to read it if you'd like me to. Otherwise, we can also reference it within our, our um, packets. Would it be helpful to, to go ahead and share those requirements? Let's see. If you are in the capital needs study, I believe it's page... Oops. Page four, including the title sheet. It's dated June 27th, 2022. And that was uh, made available publicly at the announcement of the, this, of the, at the announcement of this project, of the program. Do we move on to the next presentation, or do we need a moment to spend time with the requirements? They're always helpful for me to review. Okay. Move on to the next presentation, please. Let's move on. Okay. All right. The Herberger Theater Center's uh, project is to, do, 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 wrong page, was built in 1989 and is located at 222 East Monroe Street. It is managed by the Phoenix Convention Center and, on, and operated by a nonprofit tenant. The center has a larger center stage proscenium theater, a smaller stage west proscenium theater, a black box theater, an art gallery, and event space. The Herberger Theater Center is home to four resident companies, including the Arizona Theater Company, Arizona Opera, 
Child's Play, an eye theater collaborative, as well as a rental venue for Valley Youth Theater. The center produces theater camps, educational programs, an outdoor festival, and is a first Friday stop. The COVID-19 pandemic increased the necessity and the appreciation for outdoor live performances, and the Herberger Theater Center installed a temporary stage on the east side of the building where artists and audiences came together for physically distanced performances that included theater, dance, and concerts between November 2020 and April 2021. The Herberger Theater Center's project is to build a permanent outdoor stage with built-in lighting and sound system, shade structure, chairs, tables, and grass. The image here on the slide is of the temporary stage that made up the pavilion at the Herberger Theater Center. The pavilion stage will host a season of ongoing free events and programs such as live music, dance, festivals, poetry slams, movie nights, book readings, family fitness, yoga, dance master classes, and more. Although located downtown, the pavilion stage will be a gathering place for the entire community. The GoBon request is $4.5 million. This project is not covered under the scope of an existing project or program. Partial funding would be beneficial to the project and the rest of the funds could be raised from the private sector and donations. Cost estimates came from Willman Constructions in Gensler. The project should not be deferred and it can be completed in the next five year time period, the project will not require any additional city staff maintenance or service needs. And you can see renderings of what that outdoor pavilion would look like on the slides provided. Thank you, any questions? Done, thank you. Um, for that presentation, do we have another or does that conclude? Oh, we have a couple more. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> Didn't want that awkward. <laughs> what does she wanted me to present on next? Thank you. All right. The Phoenix Center for the Arts is located at 1202 North 3rd Street. It's managed by the Parks and Recreation Department and operated by a nonprofit tenant. While the city manages the building, it's leased and owned by, um, it, the building is owned by the Arizona Department of Transportation with a lease to the city of Phoenix. The center has a variety of art classes for adults and youth, provides programs to community organizations, schools, businesses, and operates a theater space, galleries, and hosts outdoor community programs, including the Festival of the Arts and the Mayor's Arts Awards. The center consists of two buildings, the Performing Arts Building and the Third Street Theater, and a Visual Arts Building. The center is full of vibrant life, providing home to nine resident companies and serves tens of thousands of community members each year. The scope of the project is to extend the life of the facility by replacing roofing, plumbing, lighting fixtures, flooring, HVAC systems, and cosmetic updates of the exterior of the campus buildings. Maintenance of the building has been deferred for years and the project would bring the facility up to current industry standards to better serve the needs of the community, including artists and students and patrons. The GoBon request is $8 million. The project is not convert, uh, covered under the scope of an existing project or program. Partial funding would not be beneficial to the project. Cost estimates came from SPS Plus Architects and the City of Phoenix Parks and Recreation Department. The project should not be deferred and can be completed in the five year time period and the project may require minimal staff maintenance or service needs. Madam Chair, uh, I think the question probably jumped out at a few of us here. The, uh, the initial uh, dollar amount presented at the last meeting was $2.3 million for this, and it's now eight. So I'm wondering kind of where the jump came from. So the uh, proposal again came from the, the tenant that uh, we received information from this past week, and I know we have representatives from the Phoenix Center for the Arts with us. Um, to answer your question specifically, I also have here in the audience today our previous executive um, CEOs, and that would be Lauren Henshin and also Joseph Banesh, if you would please stand. So they can also assist for further questions. The reason for the difference in the numbers, we were not included in the initial proposal. We had essentially less than eight days to try to attempt to assess all the internal aspects of our building that needed to be repaired. One thing that is missing from this proposal that we have submitted to you all separately in your packages today would be an assessment for the inside theater and lighting. So this number has moved, but you have received some additional proposals that would help to nail down what we've been able to assess and bring to you in the short time frame of only eight business days. 
but it does include complete HVAC, lighting, flooring, roofing, plumbing, everything you can imagine that would need to be um, fixed that has been deferred for many, many years in a 91-year-old building. I have, I have a question. So was this project considered at all at the very beginning um, when you were putting together the program for cultural projects? And is you said that this is owned by ADOT. Is the state of Arizona uh, responsible for doing this, or is it completely the city of Phoenix's responsibility, given that they're the tenants of the city of Phoenix? Yeah, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, um, committee member Freeman, uh, we have a really long-term lease with the whole park as well as the buildings. And so, um, I mean, it's like a 99-year lease. And so we're responsible because we're using the facilities. If, if ADOT was responsible, they probably wouldn't have any activity going on in there. So we've had a very long-term lease uh, with them, and we, we will continue to for many, many years to come. As you know, we're making improvements to Hans Park, and that is part of our, that is part of our footprint. And as to your question about inclusion, it was not identified in Parks and Recreation's cultural mm. plans. Um, so we worked with uh, the Center for the Arts to be able to include it into the public comment of this um, subcommittee. We do not manage this facility, nor does the Convention Center, which so is was made up of this subcommittee. Is, so the Parks Department would have been recommending to you for this cultural facility right you're saying that the parks department did not recommend it so it Ma did not be madam chair members of the subcommittee the parks and recreation department had they felt they needed to put this they had a lot of projects as well obviously they would have put it in theirs because they're the managers of that facility ah, okay. so that's where it would have been even though it is an art and cultural facility it's managed by a different organization so it would have been in there in with their um, building requests well, is it under our purview to consider it if it's a Parks Department project? And the other question is, I worked for the city, and in the 90s, this was in terrible shape in the 90s. So this is something that is not a new thing. It's been going on for decades. Ab absolutely. It would be fine uh, to consider it in this uh, particular um, pot of money. That would be fine if that's the, the choice of the committee. Um, I indeed, it's a historic building, and that offers its own challenges as well. Um, and, and there have been some improvements. The, the lobby and the, and the uh, elevators have been uh, added. Um, signage has been added. Um, so there, there has been some, but obviously it's, it's a very large building and needs a lot of attention. Thank you. We are excited um, to have this opportunity to present. And as you all know, the North Building, which is a part of this presentation initially, which was assessed for the Latino Cultural Support um, Community Center, which we are in support of, is attached to our building as well. So we feel that we're definitely in the right pace for the right support. And we appreciate the Office of Arts and Culture for giving us an opportunity to make sure that we serve the 35,000 plus people that come into our facility yearly for arts and cultural opportunities through this venue. We do have at least one more question. I'd like to uh, recognize that our, our vice chair has joined us. And Taniqua, if you are able to ask your question, I'll open the floor to you. If not, I have it via text message. Hearing no question, I will jump in for her. Uh, the question is, are your, are your priority needs listed within the presentation or what's been provided? Correct. So what I have provided that you all have in the packets of information um, that I see are sitting over here, we have prioritized that. We have removed the roof from consideration, and what we're looking at now is HVAC systems, which houses our youth theater because there is no air conditioning in that area. We're also looking at the much-needed improvements for our theater uh, system, which includes lighting and sound, which is currently operating on a DOS system, and we cannot any longer replace the items that are no longer functioning, um, and we are seriously um, underserved in that area of improvement. So we can absolutely and have provided some uh, areas of prioritization. Wonderful. And just um, to ensure our full attention to staff and to uh, representatives from the organizations, I did ask that the packets, any uh, materials be handed to us at the conclusion of the presentations, but then we will still have them for the discussion portion. So, yes. Is it possible for this particular project to be shared? In other words, parks 
It's also a historic building, so that would be neighborhood and city services plus arts and culture. I mean, it seems to me that all three of those pots um, are responsible for this building. Uh, Madam Chair and um, Committee Member Reiner, I, I think that would be, again, in your purview to have that information given to the executive committee. You could certainly give that as a, a recommendation. Um, staff is not here to direct your recommendation. We're here to just help answer questions. Thank you. Great question. Any additional questions on this particular presentation? Okay, we'll move on. All right. The Phoenix Theater Company is located at 1825 North Central Avenue. It's managed by the Office of Arts and Culture and operated by a nonprofit tenant. The organization is the largest professional producing regional theater company in the Valley. The Phoenix Theater Company is the oldest arts organization in Arizona and remains one of the oldest operating arts organizations in the country and is celebrating their 102nd season. The Phoenix Theater's main rehearsal hall and dance studio are located on the second floor of their building. They are not ADA accessible and cannot be retrofitted due to the physical constraints of the two stairwells that provide entry. There are no other accessible spaces on their campus that approximate the layout of their main stage. This means they cannot hire actors, directors, musicians, stage management, and other artists with mobility issues. The second floor also contains the administrative conference room and on the third floor of their administrative offices, which are similarly inaccessible to staff with mobility issues. The scope of the project is to construct a 3-4, 13,000 square foot building that would address urgent accessibility issues, offering ADA accessible offices, classrooms, studios, and rehearsal spaces. It would remedy the significant ADA deficiencies. The total project is $7.8 million, however, the go bond request is for $5.8 million. This project is not covered under the scope of an existing project or program. Partial funding would be beneficial to the project and the organization is offering the cost share of the project. Cost estimates came from Shannon Construction and the City of Phoenix Engineer's Office. The project should not be deferred and could be completed in the five-year time period. The project may require additional city staff maintenance or service needs contingent on the operating agreement between the organization and the Office of Arts and Culture. Madam Chair, uh, this is a personal statement. Uh, I was, uh, I was outraged uh, when I was sitting here, hard to control myself as was this project was being described, uh, that, uh, that the, the director, the director couldn't get uh, to the stage or couldn't get uh, to the rehearsal facilities and to other portions of this building because it was not ADA compliant. This is a hundred year old project. I've worked through, I don't know, Terry Goddard, uh, Skip Rimza, Paul Johnson, uh, Phil Gordon, and now this mayor. And all that time, no one fixed this. And I want you to understand my outrage. My son has MS. It has, uh, it's, it's a debilitating disease. It deteriorates over time. And over time, you see your son go from, become, from being an extraordinary artist to being unable to paint and to have to move in a wheelchair. And all that time, all those administrations, no one bothered to fix this? This is an outrage. I'm glad it's here. And it should not go unnoticed. So I called Phil this morning, and I intend to call every damn one of them uh, and say, how the heck could you have done this? Uh, and again, I take it very personally. Uh, so there you are. This should be approved. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Just what I am. For your comments, any questions? I thought that there was another um, pocket of funding that could potentially cover this. That was brought up at the last meeting, so I'd like to know what the status of that is. So, um, Madam Chair and uh, 
Member Freeman, uh, there is a $10.1 million pot of money for ADA improvements in another subcommittee. I believe it's the um, one this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's the one this afternoon. Um, and so obviously um, they are aware of this particular meeting. Um, and so that is, uh, that is something that they're going to discuss as far as ADA in general at that meeting this afternoon. And obviously we'll be made aware of, uh, is it before that committee too? Um, is the theater asking the ADA group for money as well? I don't know that they've come, uh, but they might come today. I, I'm not sure. They didn't come to the like previous that's, meetings. That's where it should they initially actually, be considered. I wasn't there. They, they, they did actually come to the previous meeting. So they are aware of it. The, co the committee is aware of it. And would we would be helpful to know what the other ADA needs and whether or not they, uh, how much needed is needed for other projects. Um, I mean, we can't really make a decision sure. unless we know if the ADA committee is going to be covering the ADA costs of this project. Yeah. So, so that that's uh, a complex uh, uh, question. Uh, there are lots of ADA issues across um, uh, the organization. Uh, they will be addressing it uh, with that particular group this afternoon. Um, and if we would like, we can bring that same presentation back here so I don't misspeak about the ADA uh, funding and how they do their assessments. Um, but we can bring that back next time if that's the direction of this committee. Uh, and again, there's uh, thro throughout the city, there's all sorts of needs. And so there are assessments going on, and there will be some prioritization within that uh, group of what gets funded. We do have a representative here to perhaps help answer the question uh, regarding essentially advocacy bringing this through public comment to the other subcommittee. And if you could just share with us what you shared there. Hi there. Yeah, um, we have presented to the, um, to the neighborhood services uh, subcommittee as well. Um, I think I would just like to say I don't know that I think there are many more ADA um, needs in the city facilities than can be covered even by the 10 million that's in the other uh, committee's court. And I don't know that um, a project of this size should necessarily be lumped together. And I'll bring forward a similar question that was posed uh, to the Phoenix Center for the Arts presentation regarding process. And uh, because this project came to us through public comment, was there an assessment done? Was there an invitation for the, the information? Um, again, it's I think that facility condition assessments that were done as part of the critical needs study. Um, was it, you know, again, brought forward to neighborhood services? We just want to understand uh, whether it was considered to be one of our prioritized items for this subcommittee. Sure, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. This was one of the projects that we did provide forward with a facility condition assessment. Um, however, we wanted to get the city engineer involved because what we didn't want to do were quick fixes. Um, the theater company has had many different versions of rebuilds, renovations. There are ramps that I think we mentioned the last one are not really up to the current codes. So we got the city engineer's office involved. The report, as we mentioned last time, came out after all of this information was submitted. And so we worked with the company to come to do the public comment because all the information had been collected at that point and it was not put in to the prioritized list just because we didn't have the full scale and scope by that time. But it was um, an identified project through one of our facility condition assessments at the beginning of this process. Any further discussion or questions related to this presentation? Uh, would we like to receive that detailed uh, assessment report at our next meeting? Okay. Thank you. I apologize. I'm trying to take my notes while also <laughs> following our agenda. Uh, go ahead, Director Winchester. All right. So again, we have $56.1 million in prioritized uh, needs presented by the city. Um, we had 
Uh, one of your projects we talked about today, so there's still $5.3 million in future arts and cultural capital needs with the Herbergers Center's theatrical improvements. And then today, with the addition of the Jewish Historical Society and the additional Children's Museum request, um, we have $24.5 million in community and updated projects, which makes a total of $85.9 million that we've talked about between the two meetings. Um, so I just want to put that out there as per um, uh, member Gutierrez's question of that if we wanted to do them all or talk about them all, this is the price tag for all of these projects, including prioritized future and then the amalgamation of today's um, projects. And so again, here Director are Mitch, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we were having a little bit of a technical challenge on, on our screens and that we're not able to actually see the full information due to um, an application error notice. So I just want to make sure we're able to, to read on our screens what you're also sharing. And if someone wanted to even just step back and look at what we're it, seeing. It doesn't show on their screen. Correct. So you can look at ours. <laughs> so if we could go back and stay on this current slide yeah. for a moment. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, we'll, uh, we'll have uh, staff take a look at that, but in the meantime, we can look at the screen. Okay, thank you. Not all of us can read the ones in the back of the room. We're all set. All right. <laughs> well, here is the $85.9 million with the amalgamation of what is presented over the two meetings. Um, and again, here is the prioritized capital needs from um, the city that were presented in the original study. Uh, then again, the updated needs, uh, future capital needs, which is the Herber Theater Center, and then today's um, projects. And so with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Madam Chair, I have a question. Uh, because I don't have my binder right in front of me, the $10 million that you're talking about, facilities, critical maintenance, um, is there not um, maintenance in your general budget for POLAC? There is um, general maintenance for those facilities based off of what we contribute per our operating agreements, mm -hmm. but those are for deferred projects in our facility assessments that are under the $500,000 threshold of bond projects. Okay, so can we get uh, a detailed information on what that is proposed for which facilities? Please? Yep. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mitch. Would you remind repeating that request one more time uh, just so I have it in our asks um, at the end? What I, what I requested is detailed, sorry, my headset's a little close, uh, detailed information on the expenditures for which of these cultural facilities that the city's proposed under the 10 million. And Madam Chair, Member Reiner, we will get that information yeah. to you. Okay, she just wanted me to repeat. Perfect. And do you want that as a presentation or just forwarded information like we did the two Latino Cultural Center studies? For my purposes, uh, I just need, I, w I would like, you know, I'd like to look at figures, Mitch. <laughs> okay. I'll open that question to the members of the subcommittee. Would we prefer to have it emailed to us and or a presentation at our next meeting? Email. Email it is. Thank you. Thank you. And Chair, just a comment, uh, Mitch and staff, thank you for, uh, for a great presentation and allowing us to uh, interrogate these topics so thoroughly. Thank you. Before we move on to the public comment section, again, we had presentations at our last meeting on the, the prioritized projects within the critical needs study. Any questions that have come to mind since our last meeting as a result of today's conversation? Any further comments or discussion? Don't want to lose sight of uh, what staff has recommended as those prioritized projects either as we move through this process. I do have a question about the 89, I'm sorry, 
shouldn't it just be the 56.1 million added to the 24.5? Isn't the 5.3 million um, in the 24.5? Not that that's going to make much of a difference since it's so far over what we can um, recommend, but it seems like it, it should be deducted from that 85.9, if I'm not mistaken. So, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, math was not my first language, uh, <laughs> but... Um, Nor mine. <laughs> Uh, what I had hoped to have accomplished was to move the Jewish Historical Society's project to the projects that we discussed today and add in the Children's Museum additional costs, and all three should have totaled up 89.5, but we can get you a better total. Okay, I'm just, I, I'm not good at math at either, but I was thinking that that 5.3 million, you know, included all the costs of, of, of some of those projects. Oh, so the 5.3 was just the Herberger Theater Center's theatrical improvement projects that the convention center had put forward um, as a future identified need that we have not discussed at all. Okay, thank you. I, I just have a, a question for clarification, please. Um, so uh, is it my understanding then that um, in regards to Phoenix Theater, we would be able to get further information if that's for consideration? Um, through the ADA, and also if there's going to be consideration through um, the parks and recreation for the Phoenix um, Center for the Arts? Uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, um, certainly if um, the Phoenix Center for the Arts goes to the uh, subcommittee that is the parks and recreation one, they could present their thoughts there as well. Um, and so the, the ADA, um, uh, pot of money is $10 million for the entire city. And so they, they would have discussion at that point as they get closer, which projects are going to fund if the $10.1 million actually does get funded in the bond um, as, it, as the election. So if they, if they say more or less for ADA, I mean, that might be something that comes out of that committee as well. I, I don't know what that committee is going to talk about. Thank you. But one of our recommendations as suggested by subcommittee member Reiner would be to suggest that money come from multiple subcommittee buckets essentially from historic preservation to the neighborhood services the ADA bucket um, as well as arts and culture subcommittee yeah, if that's the pleasure of the subcommittee yes Good. any other questions comments well as we move into the public comment agenda item portion of our meeting today. I do want to call attention to the public comments that have been submitted through the Go Phoenix tool. Uh, there is a compilation of those public comments that are provided at the, the end of uh, each of our subcommittee agendas. Those comments are updated and uh, compiled every two weeks. And while we haven't talked about them specifically or obviously read them aloud, I do want to call attention to them because it is an impar important process part of the process uh, that our public comments also be submitted, recognized, um, and that we all spend time with those in between today's meeting and our next meeting. So with that, okay, I will turn it over. I know I, I, know I have to um, offer comments from staff here. I'll ask our city attorney to explain the rule of public comment in the geo bond committee meetings. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Members of the public may speak to comment on the general obligation bond program. The city code requires speakers to present their comments in a respectful and courteous manner. Profane language, threats, or personal attacks on members of the public subcommittee members or staff are not allowed. A person who violates these rules will lose the opportunity to continue to speak. The subcommittee and staff cannot discuss or comment on matters related to pending claims or litigation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we do have 55 speakers registered today, including 12 virtual 
12 of those, I should say, are virtual. I would like to provide two minutes uh, for each speaker. I know we have quite a few here to speak uh, on the same project and would ask you to consider donating your time for a max amount of 10 minutes for that particular project uh, in order to keep us somewhat close to our, our scheduled meeting end time, but again, want to give as much time and space to public comment as it's an important part of the process. Uh, so we'll start with our virtual participants. When your name is called, your audio device will be unmuted and you be begin your remarks. At the conclusion of the virtual speakers, we will then invite in-person attendees to the podium to address the committee. Staff, would you please call our first speaker? Our first speaker is James Garcia, followed by Trisha Smith. James, are you on the line? I am on the line. Perfect. Thank you. We can hear you, you may proceed. Yeah, so I'm here. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to the committee. Uh, I'm here really to just uh, provide some brief comments with regards to the pavilion stage project that's been proposed by the Herberger Theater Center. Uh, my affiliation uh, with that organization is that I have been doing theater in that building for almost 20 years now. Uh, I've been on the CAX Theater stage, uh, Stage West, um, uh, in the hallway, uh, <laughs> outside. <laughs> I've been everywhere. Uh, so I've performed something pretty much in every space there. Uh, the addition of a pavilion stage, um, critically important, uh, and simply because if there, it, it would be an understatement uh, to say that this is a space, a theater space, a performance space is, uh, that is literally at the heart of the Phoenix community. Um, uh, it's accessible uh, from everywhere uh, in the city. Uh, it's obviously um, uh, located adjacent to um, so many other amenities. Um, but, and it also has just uh, an extraordinary history in terms of the kind of arts that have been produced uh, in the facility, whether it's their gallery exhibits or dance or theater and so on and so forth. And so it's been um, a great benefit to me uh, to do shows there for so, so many years. Uh, and I've actually done a show outside there uh, during COVID uh, on their temporary stage. Uh, I cannot um, imagine that there wouldn't be an extraordinary use of a permanent pavilion stage and that it would be fully utilized uh, and would be of great, great benefit uh, to the city of Phoenix as a whole, uh, as well as the companies that are all already resident companies uh, there now. And I can only imagine now that uh, we are beginning to get past COVID, just beginning, um, that it's going to be a space that will be busier than ever. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Trisha Smith, followed by Helen Rimmer. Trisha, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You may proceed. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I would like to speak to you today about Phoenix Center for the Arts. Um, I have been utilizing the space there for about the last year and have some events planned over the next few years to come. Um, as you know, Phoenix Center for the Arts is a critical part of our community, not just for arts and theater, but for classes, for education. It has a unique opportunity to bring cultures and subcultures together in a way that we don't see very many places and even allow small businesses to thrive in a time where they've been recently devastated, mine included. Um, being able to bring the artists, teachers, educators, performers, uh, everyone together in a way that not very many venues allow that opportunity is critical. <clears throat> there are so many needs in that building. It is an old building. It's a very old building. And seeing people try to pull together their own resources and make these events still thrive and succeed anyway, it, while it's touching and humbling, it, it isn't acceptable. The Security there is terrible. They, there's a desperate need for lighting, fencing, just additional security in general. Um, the ceilings, the roof has extensive water damage and leakage that has gone through to the walls, the floors. Um, children use this facility for dance and theater, and it isn't safe because these repairs need to be done so badly. There are floor lifting, cracked walls, the need for lighting, the need for sound in the theater. I use the theater at least once a month. Um, the lighting and the sound is extraordinarily outdated. It really is important that this space be considered in this bond and this 
There are so many opportunities here that that could be these needs could be met quite easily. Um, it, it would just really. Oh, did I lose you? There we go. Um, <clears throat> anyway, it's it's just critical that that these repairs be met and these needs be met. This um, facility is moderately accessible. There have been some upgrades done with the elevator and things like that, but um, to our disabled community, the the access could be improved. There are just so many improvements that could be made, and and this venue really needs to be considered. Thank, Thank you very much for giving you. your time. Our next speaker is Helen Rimmer, followed by uh, Rianne uh, Casillas. Helen, are you on the line? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. You may proceed. All right. So I, I my name is Helen. It's nice to speak with everyone here today. And um, I'm actually a fellow performer with Trisha. We are in the same cast that perform, um, you know, once a month, twice a month in the Phoenix Center of Arts. Um, and it was, I had the honor to perform there for the first time last month, actually. And when I had seen the issues and heard about the issues, let me let me explain something that was very nostalgic. First of all, I loved being in the theater, so it was just it was just I was just blown away to be in a really historical, beautiful building. I've always loved this building, but recently, of course, you can see it wearing down outside physically. You see like what kinds of people, you know, the homeless communities, the foremost homeless communities that have managed to develop along there and everything like that. It is very sad to see it very much run down. And as young as I am, I'm 22. I've been a theater student my whole life. I've been a theater actor, model, performer. I'm a stunt performer currently. I, in what I've seen in all, every single types of performing arts communities in high school and performing arts, it, it seems like I've been back in high school again, but with Phoenix, it's like I'm just the underfunded theater kid, the weird theater kid again. And there, <laughs> there are so many issues I feel like that are just being undermined here when it comes to these historical buildings. I feel like it, it, there's no... There's no disagreement about it, of course, but I would just want to speak on behalf, just point out these parts um, on behalf for this program that I wanted to say about this funding. The center, of course, is a part, part, part of our community. This funding could help fix the roof of multiple buildings with the cracks, you know, missing tiles, leaks and everything like that, repair um, flooring, um, lifting tiles, leaks, everything, painting and security, of course, and fencing, lighting. It, you know, it's a very sketchy area. We want to keep it safe for families and everything like that. So that is the main issue that we're having here. So thank you for having me. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Rihanna Casillas, followed by Charlotte Torres. Rihanna, are you on the line? Rihanna is not on the line. Our next speaker is Charlotte Torres, followed by Xanthia Walker. Charlotte, are you on the line? Charlotte is not on the line. Our next speaker is Lauren uh, Hinchkin, followed by uh, Sierra Weiss. Lauren, are you on the line? Uh, okay, we have some in-person people here. I'll go to the next person. Our next person is uh, Lisa Berman, followed by Mike Parrish. Lisa, are you on the line? It appears Lisa is not on the line. Our next speaker virtually is Mike Parrish, followed by Miranda uh, DeBice. Uh, Mike, are you on the line? It appears Mike is not on the line. Our next speaker is Miranda DeBice, followed by uh, Freeman Davis. Miranda, are you on the line? Miranda is not on the line. Our next speaker is Freeman Davis, followed by, in Upper Council Chambers, Anthony uh, Fusco. Freeman, are you on the line? Perfect. Freeman does not appear on the line. Our next uh, speaker in Upper Council Chambers will be Anthony Fusco, followed by Charlotte uh, Alderman. I'm representing the Arizona Jewish Historical Society. As an educator of 17 years, I've always made emotional connections with my students by inviting them to research, using the primary source, living memory of the event. The Holocaust was the darkest days of human history, and it was so important then as it is now that students learn the true narrative of history. 
As a graduate student at NAU, I researched four local perspectives of the Holocaust back in 2009. Dr. Alexander B. White, a Schindler Jew, and my personal hero who passed away last month. Captain Jack Nemirov, a U.S. liberator of Dachau. Zvi Harry Glazer, a Soviet soldier of the Red Army, and a goose-stepping Waffen SS German soldier of World War II who had no regret nor remorse when he brought up the topic of the Holocaust. I learned then, as I know now, that hate is very real, which is why this Holocaust education project is extremely important to the remedy. And now, as time fleets and this aging population of Holocaust survivors get closer to the inevitable, it's so vitally important to cut cement their personal narratives their living memories, their connections to Phoenix, their calls to action to be better people, their artifacts and their experience of survival that need not to be ever forgotten. And now I'm working against the clock as the Arizona Jewish Historical Society's education coordinator and a Phoenix Holocaust Association board member to make this a reality, to educate 1.6 million in Phoenix on the horrors of the Holocaust and other genocides in a venue enriched in Phoenician history. So soon, these, this first generation, these precious survivors, and as a Catholic, I call them family. They'll be gone. And with it, their stories will be gone too, which is why it's so vitally important to support this initiative, which is why it's so vitally important to build this Holocaust Education Center, which is why it's so important to turn aggression into altruism, which is why it's so important to turn hate into hope. I yield my time. Thank you. Our next speaker in Upper Council Chambers is Charlotte Alderman, followed by Hannah Mack. Good morning. My name is Charlotte Edelman. I am a Holocaust survivor. I first want to thank the Arizona and Culture Subcommittee for allowing me to opportunity to express the importance of why we should be supporting the Arizona Jewish Historical Society Holocaust Education Center project today. I am not only speaking as a survivor of the Holocaust, but I'm a resident representing the city of Phoenix, where I have lived for the last 43 years. Before the Holocaust, I remember playing with my friends on terraces, going to movies and stores freely and not having a worry in life that all changed when the German soldier invaded France. I was only 10 years old. At that time, all the Jewish people lost their freedom and we had to wear a Jewish star to identify our religion. Everywhere we went, we was always in line and when we walked, we had to walk on the street where the cars were running. We felt hopeless. No one should ever experience what we all have lived through. As the war escalated, my father, who was a very smart man, moved me from place to place. In order to keep me alive, one family hid me in a cellar for nine months at risk of to themselves. The German soldiers killed anyone who hid Jews. The hope I had to reunite it with my mom, who I am very close to, helped me to be states brave and, and strong. Although the German soldier didn't capture me, they branded me. I go to bed with it and I wake up in the morning with it. I have spoken to about 15,000 students since 2012. I talk from memory I can never forget. I always end my story with a message. Love your family. You only have one family in life. Respect each other and be positive in life. No one should ever experience another genocide of any kind, regardless race, religion, or from you are from. Thank you once again for your consideration and this very important project. Our next speaker is Hannah Mack, followed by Lawrence Bell. Um, good morning. My name is Hannah Mack, and I'm honored to speak to you. Today, I am here to share a student's perspective on why it is so important that people, and especially students, learn about the Holocaust. The Arizona Jewish Historical Society's mission is, without doubt, incredibly important, since they are helping to spread the message of this devastating event that struck history. 
The most impactful learning comes from programs that are dedicated to empowering our minds with knowledge and the Holocaust education programs benefit students such as myself and others in a multitude of unforgettable ways. These programs allow the knowledge to be brought to students in a manner that is memorable and brings them the knowledge of what happened to the Jewish people. In the true story, a boy's story, a man's memory by Holocaust survivor Oscar Knobloch, he begins by saying, today, many of the people in this world insist that the Holocaust did not happen. So I have the extreme pleasure of getting to meet Mr. Noblock in person and to hear him speak about his story. And I have to ask myself, how is it that people in this world can just not know or deny one of the most unfortunate tragedies in history? Programs such as the ones from the Arizona Jewish Historical Society have given me a first-hand account of hearing survivor stories in person and getting to hear the emotions and heartbreak behind these people's voices. My generation is the last generation that will get to hear these stories firsthand from the survivors. And to add on to that, it also gives the chance to honor both the dead and the living as they had to bear witness to the atrocities committed. We need to raise awareness for human rights issues such as the Holocaust so that we can fight for rights in society and so that history will not repeat itself. The folly that this lesson and other lessons from the Holocaust have is the lasting impact that it can have on others. This is why we need Holocaust education. We need to learn so that we never forget. In order to build the future, we need to preserve and invest in the past. Thank you for your time and understanding of the incredible importance these programs bring to our community. Our next speaker is Lawrence Bell, followed by Jennifer Longton. Thank you for allowing me to speak oops, again to you guys. Um, you all had the opportunity last time to meet Oscar Knobloch, who uh, Anna is referring to there. Um, I just have a couple comments for you. I'll keep it fairly short. Uh, one, I wanted to let you all know I didn't present that last time, that we have already raised $7.1 million in cash and pledges towards this project. So when you're considering the funding, you might want to take that into account, that this is a viable project, and with your funding, especially with the City of Phoenix funding, that will help convince other donors to jump in on this project as well, because it will be a strong show of public support from the city uh, that this is something the city itself values as, uh, as an important feature in our community. Um, and finally, I just wanted to note that, uh, although you're hearing a lot from Holocaust survivors and others who have learned from them, the project is, is also includes other genocides that have taken place. So we are going to make sure, you know, the Holocaust unfortunately is not unique in history. As a genocide, there were genocides that took place before it. And unfortunately, I'm sad to say that there's been quite a few that have taken place since. And so we want to make sure that we will also document uh, some of that history as well. Because what happened in the Holocaust can happen to any of us. It's not just a Jewish uh, persecution of Jews per se. Um, and uh, we need to be aware of it, we need to remember it, and we need to always be vigilant against hate, against xenophobia, against prejudice, and that's exactly what our project is trying to do. So, thank you. Our next speaker is Jennifer Longden, followed by Jenny Holzman uh, Tetrit. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Members, good morning. My name is Jennifer Longnan. I uh, live in Council District 4. I'm also a state representative representing Legislative District 24, which is Central Phoenix and South Scottsdale. Um, I have a letter here that I'd like to share with you, if I may. But first, I want you to think for a second what it must be like to work every day in an environment that doesn't imagine you could exist within it. Uh, and that's what we see every day at this point in time for uh, certain members working at the Phoenix Theater, which is the project I'm here to talk to you about today. I've heard words like critical need. Certainly there's a critical need. And I do believe that this particular project falls squarely within the arts funding community. The arts are about free and full expression. 
and to bar anyone from being able to participate, from being able to imagine that they could participate is unconscionable. Mr. Gutierrez, I heard your words earlier and share them. Um, when it comes to the disability community, people who use wheelchairs most specifically, I want you to understand that just within residents of the city of Phoenix, if every wheelchair user were to converge at once, we would fill our sports arenas in the city of Phoenix to capacity twice simultaneously. But you don't see us in public spaces because we are barred from them. We're losing human potential. We're losing what gifts these individuals could bring to our community and what they are entitled to have for themselves as well. The city of Phoenix has known for at least 16 years that this particular building is not up to standards, is not allowed individuals to have full expression within it. And yet this project has languished and continues to languish. So I guess in conclusion, what I would just like to leave with you is this isn't about an individual, although I hope you'll hear from them uh, again. This is about the human potential that exists. The wheelchair companies, there are two international wheelchair dance companies that can't tour the city of Phoenix. Ali Stoker is a Tony Award winning artist who cannot appear on this stage. And we are losing these amazing opportunities. The arts transform. The arts not only tell us what is, but what can be and what we can imagine. And we are stifling that possibility by not adding this project. Please, please move this project forward. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jenny Holzman uh, Tetrault, followed by Cynthia Richards. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, my name is Jenny Holzman Tetro, and I proudly serve as the chair of the board of directors for the Herberger Theater. Our board of directors is thrilled about the opportunity to share information about the pavilion stage at the Herberger Theater Center. We have been referring to the pavilion stage by the four E's that it will bring entertainment, engagement opportunities, educational resources and services, and energy to the downtown Phoenix community. When the temporary stage was created during COVID, the response from the community was incredible in that the community needed and wanted a place to convene and enjoy arts or something out of their home, outside of their home. My family includes my husband, Colin, my eight-year-old son, and my six-year-old daughter, and they joined me in many performances hosted at the pavilion or the stage. Several of those included performances by the symphony and the opera. Joining our organizations in this space was second to none from an experiential perspective, brought our community together, and helped create a thriving arts community at the Herberger. Our board of directors believes that an investment in the Pavilion Stage project is support for our entire community. It is for the diverse people who will come to this gathering space to share the four E's, an experience, an emotion, educational opportunities, and the excitement of being together. Thank you for considering the Pavilion Stage project at the Herberger Theater Center. We look forward to this exciting opportunity for Phoenix as we create a community asset focused on building the vibrant arts community even further. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cynthia Richards, followed by Cindy Gong. Hello, my name is Cynthia Richards, and I am here to speak about the Phoenix Center for the Arts. I'm a singing member and a board, member of the Board of Directors for Voices of the Desert. Um, we are an LGBTQIA plus group which performs as an unconventional theatrical show chorus. Um, we have rehearsed and we store and we perform at PCA. I've been a member for six years, so I've been a member of the PCA family for six years. Um, a couple of the things that I would like to mention. We store all of our props, if you will, all of our costumes, our musical instruments at the PCA, and one really good 
um, flood of the roof could actually destroy that entire set of um, opportunity for us, and we do not have the budget to replace that. So fixing the roof is really important um, in regards to the safety of our um, our theatrical items. The second thing that I'd like to speak about is the security. We rehearse once a week on Mondays. Our rehearsal ends at approximately 9.30 at night. So um, we are there when things are very dark. The, um, the parking lot is not well lit. It creates a safety issue, not just for people that may be doing nefarious things in Hans Park at night, but also just for the basic mobility of getting back and forth to your car. You may not be able to see a pothole. You may not be able to see um, a rock or some other kind of obstacle in your way. And we have a variety of members that have mobility issues. So we are always really... Um, we're always really concerned about that from a safety point of view as well as from a mobility point of view. So we would really like to see that fixed. The next thing that I would like to say is that there are some mobility issues within the theater itself in regards to people who may have some ADA requirements that are not being met. So for instance, staircases that don't have handrails, different things like that. Um, we always find a way to get our members on and off the stage safely, but it would be nice if we were able to um, see some greater effort in that um, in that area and I want to thank you very much for allowing me to speak thanks our next speaker is Mark Metis followed by uh, Tanya Rosenfield good morning madam chair members of the subcommittee for the record my name is Cindy gone and today I'm here because I serve as the vice chair I'm the Board of Directors for Phoenix Center for the Arts, and I am speaking representing that organization only today. Sandra Bassett, Phoenix Center for the Arts CEO, has submitted the 2023 GEO Bond Project Submittal Form and a packet to be made available to the members of the subcommittee. Thank you in advance for taking the time to review that carefully. Others attending this meeting will extol the virtues and contributions of the Center for the Arts. I'm here to stress the urgent, imperative need to be included for substantial funding from the 2023 GEO bond. On the most basic level, these city-owned facilities are in dire need of health, safety, maintenance, structural repair, replacement, updating, and renovation throughout the interior and exterior. We dream of being able to fund actual enhancements. In the light of what you have heard and will review, I respectfully request that you include as a prioritized capitalized need this most urgently needed funding for the Phoenix Center for the Arts in your 2023 GEO bond project recommendations. Phoenix Center for the Arts simply cannot wait for another opportunity to present itself in 2028 or 2033. Thank you, and I yield the rest of my time. Our next speaker is Mark Metis, followed by Tanya Rosenfield. Hello again, I'm Mark Metis, and President and CEO of the organization that operates the Herberger Theater Center. I'm sure you know by now what the pavilion stage is, but what may not be clear is why. Why should the city invest precious bond funds into this project? And the answer is simple, because it will make our city better. I've heard it say that the joy of living is being together. The pavilion stage will provide numerous opportunities for everyone to do just that, be together. To help make that possible, the pavilion stage will remove barriers to ensure these opportunities are available to all. The economic barrier of ticket price is removed because of ongoing free performances. The uncertainty of going into a venue is a real barrier for some, and it's removed by the its outdoor pavilion. The barrier of inclusion is addressed because the artist on stage and the people in the audience will reflect the entire community. Since 2016, we have focused on increasing connection with the community through free performances and engagement opportunities outside the walls of our facility. In 2020, when so much of who we are was put to the test, we put our efforts into what was really important, gathering safely together to celebrate each other and the arts. So we put up a temporary stage and presented performances that were as diverse as the artists who created them. Ballet Folklorical, Katsali, AZ, Rosie's House, Dennis Rowland, The Stakes, Hana, Scorpius Dance, Phoenix Afrobeat Orchestra, and many more. 
However, the temporary stage during the pandemic created challenges that limited what we could accomplish. The permanent pavilion stage will exponentially increase opportunities and impact. There will be more entertainment through live performances, more engagement through health and wellness activities, and more opportunities to share with each other the joy of living. Thank you for your support of the pavilion stage. Our next speaker is Tanya Rosenfield, followed by Keith Dallenbeck. Good morning. My name is Tanya Rosenfeld, and I am the executive director for the Phoenix Children's Chorus. We are the premier children's chorus in the state and longtime resident of the Phoenix Center for the Arts. Since 1984, we have been changing lives through music. We have touched the lives of thousands of children over the years who have been involved in our choirs. We have performed in hundreds of concerts, gone on over 35 tours, many of them international, and had countless hours of rehearsal time in the classroom at Phoenix Center for the Arts. We represent a diverse group of participants who make our own organization, as well as the Phoenix Center for the Arts, our city, and our state proud. We could not prepare all that we are involved in without the many classrooms and rehearsal spaces at Phoenix Center for the Arts. We are in our 39th season at PCA. We love the building. It has good bones, but it is in need of attention and repair. As the rental tenant who has been at PCA the longest, we have heard promises over the years to repair the air conditioning, lights, flooring, cosmetic and structural cracks, water stains, chipped paint, plumbing issues, and the need to improve security. To address a few of those separately, the air conditioning is often out in sections of the building during our hottest months. Areas already set up for AC have recently been addressed. However, the basement, which is also inhabited by renters, does not have the ductwork needed to even get air to that space. The security is an issue. Fencing and better outdoor lighting are needed. Our rehearsals end after dark. We have over 200 children who leave the building after 9 o'clock at night, and we need better security. Arts engagement is, a vital, is vital to our vibrant city of Phoenix. Our Center for the Arts should be vibrant as well. Not just a building with a past, but a bright future where those of us who love the center and those who have yet to discover it will be able to safely participate in all that the Phoenix Center for the Arts has to offer. I also want to say that I, I am the executive director, but I have been the parent of three choristers since 2006. I have been in that building every Tuesday night for however many years, that just 16 years, and I have seen these things need to be repaired year after year after year. It's time to do something about it. Thank you for your consideration. Our next speaker is Keith Dallenbach, followed by Don Ridley. Good morning. I'm a retired attorney uh, who had practiced law in Wisconsin for 37 years, and after I retired, I wasn't sure what I was going to do, and I ended up finding the Phoenix Center for the Arts in uh, 2014, and since then, for the last eight years, I've been almost a perpetual student uh, taking uh, different types of classes, but mostly painting classes from Edna Daple. Uh, I discovered uh, the uh, program as a veteran. Uh, also, I did a video, a 45-minute video with Greg Stanton back in uh, 2018, and Greg expressed how important Phoenix Center to the Arts was to the city of Phoenix. Having been in that building for those eight years, I can tell you that the program is much better than the building. The building needs a lot of work. There's a leaky roof. There are tiles that are coming down. Uh, in the art room, the sinks got clogged with the acrylic paint when the brushes were getting uh, cleaned, and the sinks were inoperable for several months, if not longer. At times, the toilets uh, had to be closed upstairs. They didn't work. Presently, all three of the water fountains, two on the second floor, one on the first floor, all taped off and can't be used. Uh, the portion of the parking lot uh, closest to the building uh, was cordoned off for a long time. 
the center desperately needs these funds to make the improvements, and it's a great program. Thank you. Our next speaker is Don Ridley, followed by Sandra Bassett. Uh, Deputy City Manager Erickson, knowing that many speakers are here on behalf of Phoenix Center for the Arts, I would like to understand if, uh, and I see that um, Sandra Bassett is actually next, I wanted to understand who would like to donate their time because I believe she does have a presentation, so um, can we max out her time based on, on t time donations? So, so Madam Chair, um, it, that is uh, your prerogative if, if, again, in order to try to get all the comments for other things as well, if, if that's what you'd like to do um, and, uh, and they're amenable to it, then yes, certainly you could do that. So what I would ask then if uh, Sandra would like to go next, and then if there is anyone registered to speak who still has additional comments that they felt that they feel have not been heard, uh, we'll still give you that time. Um, but we do need to identify who is donating their time to Sandra. Uh, it looks by a show of hands. Uh, and, and staff, please help me out in terms of the process. We need names. Do they need to file to the back to provide you with those names? Perfect. And then I'll also ask staff, um, Sandra has referenced a presentation. I think now would be an appropriate time to hand those packets out so that we can have them uh, at our, our desks with They're us. Right here. And thank you to everyone who is donating your time. I think there are other projects who others are here to speak on. And we'll make sure we record the number of speakers all with uh, the same concerns and comments. Lord, is yours. <laughs> thank you. Um, I stand on the shoulders of all these people that are here, if you all would please stand. That includes the previous CEO, Lauren Henshin, the one before that one whose shoulders I stand on, Joseph Banesh. Our eight resident organizations that are here, our department heads, our students, our supporters, our board members, um, everyone that's here for Phoenix Center for the Arts, just stand. Let me see you guys, thank you. All right. <laughs> We thank you all for being here, and thank you for conceding some of your time today. So as you receive your packets, you're going to see the extent of the opportunity for Phoenix Center for the Arts to be put into a position to do what it has been doing with the deterioration of our building, and that is serving over eight resident organizations that live in our space every day, 50 nonprofits that use our theater, our classrooms, our studios, over 2,500 students per year that come into our facilities and use our 14 different art studios for classes. Um, the different communities that come into our spaces, look, we have been serving and we have not been doing what we should do which is taking those who have been able to come into our space because we have eliminated the barriers to entry as far as eliminating the cost restraints, eliminating the room space. We have provided them with the space, but we have underserved them continuously because our building has not been brought up to code. We have underserved them by not having current, not enhanced, not expanded, but just having systems that can be used for them to do their performances daily. We have underserved them because they have to walk around holes in the floor. They have to move their art so it's not damaged because of leaking. We have to make sure that we can navigate probably properly because of poor lighting. But still, we serve. We are arts and culture. And we deserve to have better than what we've been dealing with, as one, council, as one committee person said, since 1997. We can't wait. Why can't we wait? Because we are serving now and we want to continue to serve. But if this isn't done, we will be inhibited in our ability to continue to serve. We will have to close rooms. And that means that people who are looking for arts and culture engagement every day will no longer have it. Why we can't wait is because our constituents that come inside of our building demand and deserve better right now. Why can't we wait? Because we've been waiting oh so long just to do simple projects. Joseph can tell you in 2018 we attempted to paint our building so we could be part of the revitalization that is occurring in the downtown Phoenix area why can't we wait because we haven't been able to make art as make our buildings look as good on the outside as art makes us feel on the inside we refuse to continue to wait we've been doing it far too long 
What I ask is that you look inside of these packets of information that we've taken the time to prepare that gives you the visual interpretation of what we are seeing in, vis in, in living with every single day. We know you can't come, so we're bringing it to you. But we ask that you consider this. We are, have been, continue to be, and will always be arts and culture for the city of Phoenix. And that needs to be supported. When you have to take a piece of Marley floor and duct tape it to keep people from tripping over a piece of carpet, you have an issue. When you have to have outside organizations coming into your theater and they have to bring extra lighting and we're limited in our sound equipment that goes back to stuff that um, is even before my college days, we need to fix it. We are low cost, trying to be higher quality, reducers and eliminators of barriers of entry into arts and culture. We do what no one else is doing and for 45 years, the city has been serving. And since 2011, we have picked up where the city no longer wanted to engage and we have carried that mantle and we've carried it proudly. We cannot and should not have to continue to wait. We deserve better. We were given eight days to have an opportunity to put together as much information as we could for a situation that has been occurring for decades. We don't know exactly why we weren't recognized and given the opportunity to present in a more formal manner at a sooner time, but the time is here now, and that's why we can't wait. We understand that our situation is a precarious one because we wear so many hats with so many different city departments in which we engage, but we are arts and culture whose building happens to be run and maintained by Parks and Rec, who happens to be on the land of AZDLT. But let me tell you again, we are arts and culture. So we ask for a few considerations. One, I would love to have an opportunity, if needed, if necessary, to define exactly which path we should take as we look at um, improving our situation inside and out. So if we can have that conversation, we welcome it because we've got a very short time frame here to be able to put into somebody's pot to make this thing work for the 35,000 people that we serve every single year plus. Over 150 events in our theater, many classes continuing. We, again, cannot wait another five years. That's not physically possible for this beautiful historic building that if properly maintained can, can continue to serve well for another hundred years. So we're asking, we're begging, and we should not have to beg, but we are. We are asking, give us the consideration. Fix what has not been fixed. Right this wrong today for everyone that's coming into this place, all ages, all cultures, all demographics, LGBTQTIA+. Everyone who is coming in, diverse and inclusive, needs an opportunity, deserves an opportunity to serve in arts and culture whenever and however they choose. And we provide that and we need to fix this today. But there still remains another opportunity because even though we definitely need to be fixed, we have outgrown our facilities, so we need additional space. Going back to 2013, we also submitted a proposal and worked with the Latino Cultural Coalition to put together ideas for what could be used for the North Building that has been vacant for well over 30 years. We are so extremely pleased and proud to partner with them and stand with them today in saying, yes, you all definitely deserve a great building location that gives you what you and your community definitely have been waiting for for so long. We stand in solidarity with you as we did when we worked with you all in the proposal to help you get to where you are today. But don't ignore us. Do not continue to ignore us. We would love to have that North building and in your packets I have submitted a proposal financial and detailed in which we can take over that building and add another dimension of arts and culture to the city. So I ask that you consider our future proposal for that because that building should not continue to sit vacant when we are here begging and asking and deserving and we have earned the opportunity to continue to expand our arts and cultural engagement in this city. I stand on the shoulders of my predecessors. 
I stand on the shoulders of people who have been engaged with this building for over 45 years. I stand with each and every one of you and every citizen and constituent in the city of Phoenix to make sure that the Phoenix Center for the Arts continues to serve, continues to serve at a high level of excellence, and that we get just the bare essentials to do what we've been doing every day, but also help us to serve in a higher elevation because that's what everyone deserves. I thank you for your consideration of this request. I look forward to further meetings to figure out where do we go, how do we go, how do we get what we need that has been denied to us and our constituents for so long. But most of all, I assure you of one thing, the Phoenix Center for the Arts will continue to serve. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kate Wells, followed by Erica Maxwell. And while we're waiting for Kate Wells to make her way to the microphone, I'd ask that if there are any speakers who have not yielded their time, who are signed up for Phoenix Center for the Arts, um, if there are additional comments that you want to make, if you could even, uh, I guess, make your way to the microphone so that we can be aware of uh, whether individuals are yielding their time or not to our previous uh, speaker. I want to get a sense of uh, the additional time that we'll need here today. Okay. Kate okay, Wells, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, um, and thank you um, to the committee for giving me the opportunity to clarify our project, pro our project proposal um, that finishes what was started in the 2001 bond election. Um, I've provided for you, I think it's going to get passed out, a packet that looks like this um, for your consideration. And in it, it includes our project summary, our current conditions with photographs of all 11 rooms that we are hoping to get renovated. Um, floor plans that show how our rooms are stacked and also interconnected, and a detailed budget um, that will really kind of spell out um, how the different rooms investments um, could, could be used, including the four rooms um, that we were talking about um, in the initial proposal. Um, the urgency, I, I really want to focus on the urgency of our proposal. Um, on a daily basis, the Children's Museum is at or above capacity. This summer, we had our, our, our best summer ever, thank goodness, and we literally had to turn families away at our free first Friday nights because our building is capacity. Unfortunately, it, well, unfortunately, it doesn't need to be. We have the opportunity to increase the square footage that we have available to the community. Um, we are the only um, major arts and cultural organization in our entire county, and dare I say the state, that provides this focused attention on ch young children, zero to 10, and families. This is a huge, huge gap in all parts of our community, not just in the arts and cultural space. Um, the way we invest in education for young children is pathetic, and um, the Children's Museum focuses so much attention on those very young and impressionable years. I might also... Um, bring up that um, of the 40,000 children that will come through our doors this year alone on field trips, more than three quarters of them have never been to any arts and cultural spaces in their entire life. So um, we appreciate your support and um, is there any questions? I'm happy to answer them. Our next speaker is Erica Maxwell followed by Ricardo uh, Bernal. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Erica Maxwell, and I'm a board member of the Children's Museum of Phoenix, serving as the co-chair for the Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Accessibility Committee. Also, I worked at the state level as the first ever associate superintendent of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and I'm currently a diversity consultant. Equity is about outcomes. I preach that all the time. It's about the outcomes that we have. In the Children's Museum of Phoenix, in the arts and culture community, positively impacts outcomes for children and their families. 
the Every Child program alone serves upwards of 75,000 children and families, allowing them access to the museum, providing opportunities to engage in educational activities. More and more children and families are attending the museum for free. That really impacts outcomes for them educationally. And we want to continue to impact families. As you just heard Kate said, she, we have had to turn families away. We do not want to have to turn families away ever because of the limited space that the museum currently operates in. If we want to continue to impact the growing population of children and families in the state of Arizona, in the city of Phoenix, we must complete the renovation of the building, which will allow access across the board and expand opportunities. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today. Our next speaker is Ricardo uh, Bernal, followed by Matthew Schaefer. Hello, my name is Ricardo, and uh, thank you for allowing us this opportunity, uh, subcommittee, to share our thoughts with you. Um, like many people here, I have uh, fallen in love with the community of cultural and arts, and um, being part of the Children's Museum of Phoenix, I have seen firsthand the impact that these programs have in our communities. Um, specifically, like Kate said, the zero to 10 range is such a huge impactful time in their life and for us to have a, a building and a community for them to come and play and learn from one another is really uh, important to us. It's really what drives our mission. Um, our camp program serves about a few hundred, uh, three to four hundred kids throughout the year. Um, crucial to our school breaks, uh, summer, fall, winter, and spring. And through this program, we've been able to introduce inclusive practices um, that allow not just your able-bodied uh, children to be going into these camp programs, but children on the spectrum, children um, diagnosed with autism, children who have um, able-bodied uh, challenges. So what we've done is we've tried to uh, create that community for them so they all feel included and they all have a place here at the Children's Museum of Phoenix. But uh, we've seen that through the growth of these practices and inclusion, um, there are still children that we cannot serve because of space limitations. Uh, we've seen this year that, uh, as Kate said, it was a huge summer for us and it was a lot of impact that happened in these communities and these spaces. But even through all of that growth and that impact, there were still a number of kids uh, and, and families that we had to turn away because of not being able to provide the space necessary for safety and for these best practices. Um, we've seen firsthand that the limitations of some of these rooms that aren't up to code that could be used as um, spaces for uh, different programming that we provide, whether it's um, partners and networks that we include into our museum and into programming to engage in more culture and more diversity, uh, or the programming that we have every day that serves our families, serves uh, mothers that are learning, serves uh, informal educators to come and provide um, more additional educational support uh, in this building. So thank you again for allowing us this opportunity. Thank you. Acknowledging the time and the fact that at our next meeting we want to have heard of any new projects to consider, uh, again in time for our third meeting, I would like to ask anyone who has signed up to speak, if you are here to speak on a new project, could you raise your hand? I realize that I'm a little bit non-traditional here. Okay, we have two speakers. And so we have two new projects. Uh, and. and projects that are in the critical needs study or new or project that has not been talked about yet uh, if you could raise your hand I know we have at least one okay excellent I'd like to hear from those three speakers before we lose anyone on our subcommittee and also ask um, thank you for standing for me Phoenix Center for the Arts I do want to give you your time um, so if we could have those three speakers make their way to the podium and then we'll take uh, Lauren, Joseph, et cetera. If anyone does not have a, a new point to make but wants to be on the record that they're in support of a project, 
uh, we would be happy to record your name and that fact at the back. Again, I just want to make sure all projects have a chance to be heard and that everyone's public support is recorded. So we'll take uh, Bob Cooper first and then our two additional speakers who raised their hands on new projects and then I'll turn it over uh, again to Joseph from there. So if anyone's willing to yield their time and just acknowledge that they're in support of everything that has been shared thus far, uh, we would accept that into public comment and record. Okay. Thank you. Staff, uh, did I misstep at all? Madam Chair, also um, they could put their comments in writing and get them uh, online as well. Good morning. Uh, Madam Chair and subcommittee members, thank you so much for your time and commitment to support the arts and, and culture subcommittee and bond process and for your support of the arts community as a whole. My name is Bob Cooper. I'm the producing artistic director of Valley Youth Theater. I've had the honor of serving this organization for over 26 years. I'm here to support the Valley Youth Theater permanent home project. I can totally relate to Phoenix Center and uh, you'll hear more about that. Um, in 2000, it, the project, and we're thrilled to be included as a prioritized um, project on the list. Um, we hope that you will still consider full funding. In 2001, we started this journey with a proposal for a permanent home for Value Theater. We were included in the funding for $1.5 million to purchase the land and purchase our more than three quarter of a million dollar investment in the building and for the future expansion of our project. We were also included on the ballot for the voters to see, and they voted yes. So we were happy to be included. In 2006, we submitted a proposal to the Arts and Culture Committee. Our hope was to finish what we had started five years earlier. Unfortunately, there were numerous projects that had greater priority than ours, and we weren't included. Now here we are 16 years later, and we still do not have a permanent home. Children are our future. And for 33 years, Valley Youth Theater has been inspiring young people to be the best that they can be. We have been an important part of the fabric of Phoenix, and our long list of alum are contributing to the greatness of our society. Please, please, please make the children of our community a priority this time by supporting the funding necessary to secure our permanent home for Valley Youth Theater and the children we serve. Children are our future, and together we can finish what we started 21 years ago. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. My name is Cheryl Brunkish. Since 2018, I've had the privilege of being president of Phoenix Holocaust Association. I am the daughter of two survivors. Some 60 survivors of the Holocaust currently live in the greater Phoenix area, and we estimate that there are close to 100 across Arizona. Phoenix Holocaust Association is a very small organization with a giant mission to honor the memory and legacy of the survivors and victims and promote awareness and education of the Holocaust and other genocides. To accomplish these objectives, we partner with other organizations. Two of our most important partners are Arizona Jewish Historical Society and Arizona State University. I am proud that Phoenix Holocaust Association was instrumental in the three-year effort to pass a law requiring the teaching of the Holocaust and other genocides in all Arizona schools. This one-year-old mandate has increased requests for eyewitness speakers, teacher training, and help in making the subject relevant to today's students. The proposed Holocaust Education Center will help fulfill this education mandate. PHA desperately wants there to be survivors to witness the grand opening of this Holocaust Education Center. Learning about the dangers of hatred and discrimination in the Holocaust are important to fighting intolerance and prejudice in today's world. We encourage this Arts and Culture Subcommittee to recommend inclusion of the much needed Holocaust Education Center in the Phoenix 
uh, geo bond measure. Thank you. I believe we had one speaker on a new project. Please, I, had, I thought I had two hands raised. No? Oh, thank you. Hi. Um, I, I wanted to follow up on something I said earlier that we had presented to the Neighborhood Services Subcommittee. Um, we, we did that through the public comment section, and that subcommittee has not asked for more um, information on the Phoenix Theater ADA project. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, in addition, I just wanted to um, thank you all for your consideration of our project and reiterate what Representative Longden said earlier. Um, I, I kind of feel like I've had a spotlight on me, and I, that's uncomfortable, but I want to I want to reiterate that it's a much broader community that can be served um, and engage with the art that the Phoenix Theater Company is producing if we had accessible spaces for them. So thank you very much. Our next speaker is Matthew Schaefer, followed by Lauren Hinchin. Oh, apologies, that was Matthew. Uh, our next speaker is Lauren Hinchin, followed by uh, Cicely uh, Wiener. Thank you, Madam Chair and subcommittee members. My name is Lauren Henschen. I am here today in support of the funding request made by Phoenix Center for the Arts. I had the honor of serving this organization for 10 years, the final three of which I served as the center's CEO. I will keep this brief. Phoenix Center for the Arts is a true community resource providing access to valuable education and tools like ceramics kilns, a photo lab, and a 216-seat theater. It's an understatement to say this amazing 91-year-old arts campus would greatly benefit from this bond funding dedicated to repair and revitalization of this commu important community asset. The center's goal has always been to serve as many community members as possible. Right now, their ability to serve the community is hindered only by the condition and capabilities of the physical space. Regularly during my time at the center, we experienced building-related issues which resulted in the need to cancel classes, programs, or events at the last minute. Despite all the obstacles you've already heard about, the center is thriving, namely because of the organization's commitment to access and creative opportunities for all. In addition to the hundreds of unique art classes the center offers each year and the tens of thousands of community members served, the center is home to eight additional resident arts organizations, also nonprofits, who extend the reach and impact of Phoenix Center for the Arts in the community. Funding improvements to this arts and culture hub will help Phoenix Center for the Arts become a 21st century arts and culture facility a point of pride for the Phoenix community, the clean and safe, creative and collaborative arts campus that our community deserves. Investing in the center isn't just investing in the center itself, it's investing in all of the community groups who utilize this resource and all the community members who will remember their creative journey at Phoenix Center for the Arts for many years to come. Thank you. Our next speaker is Cicely Wiener followed by Michael Bernard. Good morning, I'm Cecily Wiener, Director of Community Engagement at the Herberger Theater Center. With increasing urbanization, communities are continuously seeking new ways to provide outdoor spaces and activities to residents. Therefore, the proposed permanent HTC Pavilion Stage project is absolutely urgent. As Director of Community Engagement, I plan and facilitate outreach programming like performance pop-ups, First Friday Live, Festival of the Arts, and other special events, programs, performances that are held outdoors. During these daytime events, performers and attendees have commented about the extremely hot surface of the temporary stage and intense sunlight glare, all due to the yearly steadily rising heat index in Maricopa County. The purpose of the pavilion stage at the Herberger Theater Center is to create a gathering place that will celebrate the arts and the community. This merger of art and space is designed to offer shade and comfort and is sure to draw more people during the daytime events and at night a beautiful lit visual stunner. 
This proposed pavilion stage project will be an urban marvel for the performing arts in Phoenix, adding a cosmopolitan look and feel to the Valley of the Sun. Thank you so much, everyone. And, and if I may, after uh, Michael speaks, we'll work our way through the, the rest of our Phoenix Center for the Arts folks. And again, um, only if you have new comments to make, I would encourage you to, to share your comments with us. Otherwise, um, it would be helpful to record those as uh, public support and or online as well. Uh, Michael's our next speaker. Wasn't quite sure of my cue. Uh, <laughs> Hi, my name is Michael Barnard. I'm the Producing Artistic Director of the Phoenix Theatre Company. And I thank you humbly um, for allowing us to speak um, today and <clears throat> to make our plea. Uh, we are one of the largest employers of freelance artists in the state. Actors, designers, staff, crews, orchestras. Um, we serve about 150,000 patrons a year. Our ADA uh, compliant is, uh, is great for our patrons in front of house, but it is uh, <clears throat> definitely underserved in our backstage areas. We need to be inclusive um, to the mobility challenged and also for those who have perhaps reached an age or um, uh, are dealing with other uh, physical um, ailments that uh, make it very difficult to climb steep stairs. Um, we would like to have a safe access space. Uh, it's the key um, to creating art and being inclusive to all individuals in our state. Uh, this includes to offices, re rehearsal spaces, and etc. Um, we did go to the ADA um, meeting last last week, but we were not asked to present, and so. Uh, we're going to go back this afternoon again, um, but we wanted to come back here um, because of those reasons. Uh, we've spent years uh, patchworking our accessibility backstage, um, and this is also include, uh, inclusive of our summer camps for um, <clears throat> children as well um, that have mobility issues. Um, but the backstage areas to, um, oh gosh, dressing rooms, rehearsal spaces, office spaces, etc., is a patchwork of um, um, things that we have tried to do to make things better or accessible. This funding would create a space that would be safe and address all of our needs. We appreciate um, you listening to us and humbly consider you, um, your request for funding. Our next speaker is Tom Evans, followed by Sarah Sullivan. Sorry, folks, I didn't hear you. Um, I'm Tom Evans. I'm a Phoenix resident. I'm a, uh, here today as a board member of the Herberger Theater Center. Um, I live in central Phoenix. I work downtown. I walked over here, so you know, I'm in this area quite a bit. Um, the Herberger was built, as all of you know, as part of a broad effort to revitalize the downtown community, and it included a lot of different components. And that effort over the years, over the three decades, you know, between when the Herberger was built into when the pandemic hit, was working. The buzz in downtown was increasing. But the pandemic stopped all that and brought not only the performing arts to a halt, it brought really the entire downtown community to a halt. And during this time, during this difficult time, the Herberger pivoted and it used its outdoor facility to help keep the arts alive in this community. Like many adaptations that were made during the pandemic, it provided a glimpse into an actual opportunity. The pavilion space became a place where the arts were kept alive um, and where the arts could thrive despite the fact that we were living in pandemic conditions. There's really a surprising lack of such similar space in a community that has a tremendous climate. There's really not that many quality outdoor venues for the arts and for events. It's a really unique situation and it's a really unique opportunity. 
the performing arts are still down in our, in our community and every community. They're still seeing a dip in attendance that they're still fighting to overcome because people, there are some people that just aren't ready to come back to an indoor space. This is an amazing opportunity to address that and to create a community amenity that will go back to that original mission that the Herberger and other projects had of re really revitalizing downtown Phoenix and creating that buzz that makes this a special community. And the new programming that will be created that will be accessible to the community as a whole will make the arts in uh, Arizona stronger in general. So all of these projects are incredibly worthy. I don't envy your um, having to make decisions, but uh, one, wanted to see if you would consider ours as well. So thank you very much. And I'm going to interrupt and, and go ahead and ask Joseph uh, or one of those standing to go next. And I apologize that I've had you standing there as long as I have. I just wanted to make sure we knew how many we have left. Go ahead. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, hope everyone's well. My name is Sophia Fankin. Um, I am an artistic collaborator at Rising Youth Theater. Um, I have been coming to PCA for most of my life. I took my AP exams there. I did my time at Phoenix Children's Chorus. Um, but now I work at Rising Youth Theater, um, which is a youth leadership organization operating in the black box in the basement of Phoenix Center for the Arts. Um, we have young people and adults on staff. Um, we serve as an artistic home for hundreds of youth and adult artists from all across the valley. I come from Glendale. Um, we serve as an open and welcoming space for youth and adults to collaborate in an artistic space. And we also pay all of our artists, no matter how young they are, we can have a 13-year-old in our ensemble and they will get compensated for their time. Um, we recently had performances in the basement of PCA in May of this year. Um, a couple of weekends with a really good turnout of audience. Um, we don't have any air conditioning in our basement space where we perform, um, so all of our audience members came. Um, we provided them with fans. Um, we have a couple of box fans and swiveling fans. Doesn't really get the job done. Um, and it's a matter of dignity, I believe. Um, I think that our artists deserve a space where they're able to operate comfortably and safely. Uh, we all know how hot it is. I think that in this room, if there were no air conditioning, we probably wouldn't get that much done. Um, so, thank you. And I'm Sarah Sullivan. I also work at Rising Youth Theater um, with these collaborators. We at Rising Youth Theater have been a part of the Phoenix Center for the Arts since we were founded 10 years ago. Um, and I, we just really want to highlight how, uh, how much Phoenix Center for the Arts does for small arts organizations that have an idea and a mission and a vision and need infrastructure and support. PCA was there for us from the very beginning and helped nurture us into the thriving organization we are now that supports staff and hundreds of young people every year. Um, this is what Phoenix Center for the Arts has been doing for so long with really challenging circumstances. And I just want to say, like, imagine what that space could do with the right resources. My name is Tamina Mohammed, and I don't want to repeat too many things since it's already been said about Phoenix Center for the Arts, but I am the camp and ca classes manager for Rising Youth Theater and for Phoenix Center for the Arts uh, summer camp. We had a lot of young people in the basement this year uh, in the heat. We have a bunch of box fans, as Sophia mentioned, uh, that rotate the air, but I just want to emphasize that it's not just uh, the organizations that are the residents there, it's also the people that we serve. Uh, so just wanna ask and say thank you again uh, for hearing us out. Are we, are we still going? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Joseph Benish. Uh, I've lived in Phoenix for almost 30 years. And thank you again for the impossible job you have ahead of you. And I want to celebrate all my colleagues and friends here. I'm here uh, representing Phoenix Center for the Arts today. And sitting there, I decided to reframe my comments because you can't help but be moved by what we've heard today. I see. Uh, a lot of, uh, especially four really strong opportunities ahead of you. Seems like you have the opportunity to help prevent future genocide. It seems like you have the opportunity to help build a long overdue Latino Arts and Culture Center 
and build it in the right place, the place that the community wants it. I refer you back to the comments of uh, your committee members at the last meeting. You have the opportunity to help make sure our region's largest theater is accessible to everybody. And you have the opportunity to make sure that when artists and patrons are coming from all around the city, small organizations, that they're not getting rained on. Literally, I'm, question, like, would you sit here if water was dripping on your head after one of our beautiful monsoons? Would you come back regularly if you thought you might trip coming up these from old carpet and old floors that are pulling up and being held down by duct tape? Would you tolerate that in your own home? That is one of the opportunities you have here today if you're able to recommend Phoenix Center for the Arts for funding. And the last point I want to make, uh, Sandra mentioned you know, serving 35,000 people, but something that a lot of people forget about Phoenix Center for the Arts is that most of those people come back every week. So the people in the arts classes, at the children's course, probably five, six, seven days a week for the youth theater. So maybe multiply that 35,000, going back to our math challenges, multiply that by 40. Those are the number of visits you're serving at Phoenix Center for the Arts. Thanks. Good morning, soon to be afternoon. Uh, chairwoman, members of the subcommittee, staff, and all of my colleagues and participants at Phoenix Center for the Arts. Good morning. My name is Martin Bridgman. I am board chair, resident of downtown District 7, and an avid supporter of the arts as well. I recently did a tour of the campus on Monday where you've heard multiple times about the HVAC, the cooling, but there was a special, there were two items that stuck out to me. The first was that we talked about the flooring, but I was able to pick up pieces of the flooring while I was touring and getting to the actual subfloor, not just peeling up a carpet tile or floor tile, but actually getting to the wood, which is not safe when you're dealing with kids, you're dealing with those who have mobility issues, that is not a good thing to have. In addition to that, I was able to see walls that revealed the age of the building and then specifically the interior lighting. I had an opportunity to speak with campus staff and specifically Cadell, who was our facilities manager. I hope I got the title right. And he mentioned, if you look up at the ceiling, you have these lights that are sure uncontrolled by switches with LEDs. What's having to occur is that when we are having performances at the theater is we are having to pay someone to come out and use gel film. So instead of hitting a button on your computer or on your phone to change the light color, someone is having to get on a ladder and get up to those lights, which are probably 20, 30 feet in the ceiling, and change the gel sheet so that they can have a color for the show that they want. That cost us money, and Phoenix Center for the Arts is fortunate enough that we are a self-sufficient organization operationally. We're able to run, fund our staff, fund our programs, but when we are having to look at things like upgrading our lighting, our cooling, our flooring, a true capital campaign, which is where we need help, and that is why we are here in front of the bond committee and asking for support in our endeavors to help improve our, because what we are doing is we're not, we are here to solicit, solicit the board funds, but not to offer world-class facilities, but to improve the artistic expression for youth, seniors, our downtown community and the city because we deserve it and our citizens deserve it. Have a great day. Our next speaker is Vanessa Ramirez followed by Freeman Davis. Good morning, afternoon. My name is Vanessa Ramirez. I'm the executive and artistic director of Ballet Folklorico Quetzali. We are a nonprofit dance organization primarily focusing on Mexican Hispanic heritage. Um, our dancers' ages are two to 65 and plus, and I'm here in support of the Herberger Theater. During the pandemic, um, we were forced to close down our studio and move out, and I didn't have a home for my dancers. And thanks to the pavilion that they did have outside, we were able to continue to perform and give that opportunity to our students that 
everything we've built over the past 14 years wasn't going to completely go away. Um, and it was wonderful because we were able to bring families, community, students in a, in a safe place outdoors to continue to enjoy the arts um, and give us that sense of unity and community that we all needed, especially during the pandemic. So I'm definitely in support of that, and I hope you will be as well. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Freeman Davis, followed by uh, Marguerite Dietrich. For the members of the subcommittee, we do have a hard stop of 11.45. We believe we have maybe three speakers left, and we'll be able to uh, have our discussion before breaking by 11.45. Freeman Davis does not appear to be in the room, so our final speaker is Marguerite Dietrich. who also appears not to be in the room. Madam Chair, that is our final speaker. Thank you. This concludes our public comment period. Thank you to everyone who did participate. I'll open the meeting to subcommittee members for comments. Um, I wanted to see if there can be, uh, I'm not sure how this can work, but I'm, I'm thinking about the Super Bowl that's coming next year and um, you know how downtown is going to be full of entertainment and arts and culture is going to be somewhat in the forefront. Um, I would like to see if I can get a request on how much the Super Bowl is going to be pledging or investing in the arts and culture and to see if there can maybe be some type of um, cohesive um, money that can be put together uh, for the arts um, and I think I know that Margaret Hans Park is going to be a center point starting now with the new, uh, I think it's Zona, Zona Fest Music Festival. And with the uh, Phoenix uh, Center of the Arts being front and center there, I think it's a really good uh, opportunity to, for them to be the gateway and the ambassador when people come in town. And I think that park is going to be highly visible. It's going to be highly used. And I think it would be, um, it would be a dishonor to have that building uh, looking like how it is, but I think to not only just do the basic improvements as we hear, they're just the basic needs, but I think how can we make that, you know, somewhat like a world class, you know, and start heading in that direction in, in, in different phases. So I'm looking to see how the city can get, um, create that corporate responsibility uh, to Super Bowl and any big corporates that are coming in town for the Super Bowl and, and, and requesting to see and how they can invest in all these and, and the arts and culture in general, for it doesn't feel like a, you know, like a hunger game, you know, for everybody for arts and culture, and and, and it's you know, so to to avoid that, I'm, I'm so there's a request there as as far as the Super Bowl and what's what can we do to get them to pledge, uh, in, into the arts and culture communities. Um, another one is there. Uh, I think it goes back to the ADA. I think is there any like, um, how do we create a policy? Uh, to make sure that everything, all the arts and culture buildings, as well as any building in the city has, uh, you know, ADA compliance. Um, but also, I think also, I, you know, going back to um, to the north building of, of Phoenix Center of the Arts, I think when we, when I first started hearing about the Latino Cultural Center going there, right away I just felt like there was just this uh, shadowing of the Phoenix Arts and Culture with the Latino Cultural Center there, and I almost felt like there was like this type of bullying happening um, as you can need is like we're we're here talking about trying to bring something to a north building that needs to be rehabilitated but here the next door neighbors are, are, are you know as you can see their roofs are falling apart and in water leak so just wanted to make high considerations and, and I you know I'm also on board to making sure that we try to do our best to get these funds to them and, and make sure that they're on board because it's like I think going back to the equity and I think for them being right in the front yard and right on the gateway when you get off the freeway would be a, a total loss uh, for us not to invest in that. Um, and another one, I think going back to a corporate responsibility, and I'm just trying to come up with solutions. There's so much that I'm downloading that it's probably going to take the next sessions. But I think, um, I think with the roof, and I think with everything being talked by the city about uh, moving forward with the whole sustainability, you know, electric cars and everything on, on, under that roof, is there a way that maybe the city can talk to APS to see if they can sponsor this roof, uh, new roof at the um, Phoenix Center of the Arts, and not only that, add some some solar? So there's just I'm just kind of brain dumping on some solutions, but I think um, 
I think there's, I think, you know, we know what the problems are and we hear it loud and clear. I think just, I think if we can put more time into the solutions and I think we, the city has a lot of great partnerships and I think we see a lot of those um, examples around, um, you know, in, in downtown areas. So, so yeah, just c try to consider that. But I think right now my main focus or what I'm thinking out of all this is how do we create that corporate responsibility with the city of Phoenix partners that they have now. And, and Sam, as I'm compiling our request for the next meeting, give me a little bit of clarity on the, the North Building comments related to Phoenix Center for the Arts. I think, uh, I, I do believe that Phoenix Center of the Arts should have that building as well uh, as an extension to their programming. Like I said, they are the gateway, they're on the frontier, they're like the ambassador when you come and get off the freeway. So I wanna make sure that as a born and raised Phoenician, as well as seeing these buildings that get ter turned down and it's also, you know, it'll, it's also tearing down and it's also a, a type of, uh, 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 it's not close or it's not near close and I don't wanna take this out of context in any disrespect, but it is also, also part of, of a cultural genocide when it comes to cities and cultures and when you start dismissing the history here and the buildings here and the architectural here just for the new development, for the fast paced development, I think it, it's also a dishonoring and I don't, I, as a person here, uh, born and raised, and don't, do not want the city of Phoenix to be continuing that type of culture. So, um, I, as to make the clear, to make it clear, I am, I am, um, I am proposing that the North Building should be highly considered to be part of the Phoenix Center of the Arts. So, perhaps as part of uh, next meeting's agenda, more information about Phoenix Center for the Arts proposal or desire to. Uh, take over the North Building yes. as well. Okay, because I know that is in the presentation here too. Annette? Mm -hmm. um, I have a question. I, I'd like to just have some understanding about um, the support, the financial support behind, behind the Phoenix Center of the Arts. Um, if it's in the state that it's in right now, uh, according to what we've heard from ev everyone, how did it get there and, and who was financially responsible for it? And if we were to provide funding, who would be the ongoing, um, where would the ongoing revenue come from to support the facility? Because from what I'm hearing, it's been in this shape for years and it's getting worse. And is there, um, is, is there corporate support? Is there community support? Is it supposed to be the city? Is it supposed to be this? Who, how did it get to this? And if we provide funding, how will we know it won't end up in such a state years from now again? I'd like, I'd like some more information about how, how this all happened. Perfect, so I think we need to learn more information about the city's agreement with Phoenix Center for the Arts, the city's responsibilities versus the organizations and, and included in that the financial uh, responsibilities aspect. Yes, yeah, I'm sure that would be perfect, thank you. Madam Chair, um, it, just so I can get a uh, clear direction. We can present on it, but we could also send some uh, documents ahead of time, like the operating agreement, those kinds of things, if that's of, of help. That might help you prepare the questions for the meeting, right? Uh, just following up on Member Gomez's comments, uh, specifically relating to the Latino Cultural Center, um, the, cost dollar, the cost estimates we have appear to have been for that north building and a renovation, correct? If there is some discussion about locating it at a different location, I would imagine there's a different cost associated with a new construction versus a renovation, siting, those kinds of things. And given also the five-year time horizon for a project like that, I think it's important for us to understand the investment it would require to deliver a project that something like that deserves if it's not in the, the uh, space that this uh, was already budgeted for. Um, just so that we can be realistic about what that might actually be um, as we continue to discuss moving forward. So if staff could take a, take a look at that, would be great. Uh, information that, 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 that might be useful at this point in, in, in regard to your comments, first to the, the chairperson's uh, initial comments, that it is not necessarily the role of this body to specifically locate a, uh, a project. And uh, that was interesting and helpful for the following reasons. Obviously, many of us believe that the North Building 
does not have the kind of cultural significance for the Latino community, story community, and I'm very disappointed that the city spent so much time uh, without, uh, you know, sort of looking around, if you will, at other extraordinary possibilities. One of those possibilities, of course, is the Santa Rita Center and, and the land surrounding the Santa Rita Center, which belongs to the city and to Chicanos for la Causa. Uh, just uh, parenthetically, Chicanos for la Causa this year has a budget of well over $100 million and its net worth uh, is, uh, is multiples of that. Uh, those discussions have begun to locate a, uh, a, uh, a magnificent, if you will, uh, culturally significant Latino cultural center there. And thus, those discussions have begun. I, I uh, uh, and, and I'm fully in support of those discussions, but it, it, given the situation that the, the city has put us in, uh, recommending the North Building. Uh, I think the, the, the recommendation you'll find is, is we go forward here. Those discussions are not completed, uh, but I think they will be before this is over, uh, or at least preliminarily so. Uh, the, the, I think the goal would be to maintain the current recommendation with just simply the addendum as defined by the chairperson that we're not specifically tied to that location. But let me make it very clear. I, I think the majority of the Latino community finds, and the arts community as well, the recommendation by the city is almost offensive given all the opportunities in this city and given the fact that this is the fifth largest city in the United States. Let me say again, that will be a majority Latino uh, in, uh, in, in very few years. Uh, it depends on what source you're looking at, but within five years, perhaps, it'll be majority Latino. And the recommendation is to refurbish a church. That church would be perfect for the Phoenix Art Center. It's contiguous. It's in much better shape. Uh, and uh, it would take substantially less to make that uh, Phoenix Art Center a, a jewel of this community. So I, as we go forward, I will be recommending that we go forward with a recommendation for the Latino Center as it is with that addendum. So that those discussions, if they prove fruitful, and I believe they will because of the players involved. Uh, uh, there are elected officials, there are uh, uh, the, the, the principals of uh, CPLC, one of the largest nonprofits in the country. And, uh, uh, and, and, and a great many Latino uh, uh, activists are greatly in favor of seeing if we could do that. So I, I just offer that as a, uh, as some information that might be relevant as we go forward. Excellent comment. I'll make sure I record that for our discussion at our, our next meeting so Thank that you. we can include that addendum. Yes, Gretchen. I know that we are not supposed to make uh, recommendations about facilities and where they should be located, but we have a budget, and the budget is based upon uh, estimates for a building that the Latino Cultural Center does not well, some representatives do not want to go into. So we have to have a reality check here. We cannot give money based on something that is based on a project uh, which is not going to be taking place at a particular location potentially. I think, does that make sense? I just, I, uh, I, I, I don't think we can say, yes, give them $21 million, but that money, that, 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 amount was based on something very specific so, and I believe, doesn't, may not exist anymore. And I believe that ties back to some of the initial questions related to the what, what amount can we recommend, recommend for projects. Um, and so we should continue that conversation. But I believe because we've been through the public comment portion, we're not supposed to be discussing our recommendations at this point, um, but rather reserve those for our next meeting. Um, is that correct? I don't uh, need to shut the conversation down. I just want to follow process. Madam Chair, 
um, members of the subcommittee, I think you can discuss recommendations. Okay. Um, the public comment section was really um, geared toward an item on the agenda as opposed to being public comment at the end of a meeting. Great. And so I just want to just. Yeah, yeah, so for that meeting next, uh, or our third meeting, is there more related to this conversation that we want to receive well, information about? Well, I know that we've asked twice now for budget, detailed budgets. We asked at the first meeting, we've asked at this meeting. And we cannot make recommendations if we don't understand the budgets. And that is also estimates that confirm those budgets. So I, we really need a reality check about what we're dealing with and what we're going to be recommending. I, I tried to make clear earlier on that uh, what we're being presented with uh, is, is a set of recommendations, but we are not serving as the Appropriations Committee. If we were to serve as the Appropriation Committee, taking any example, uh, the Herberg Theater, for example, uh, to see if their budget is appropriate and correct, we should have every line item before us. We do not. We should have every line item before us uh, for every project uh, that has been recommended. We do not. And so what we have are these general estimates, uh, and that's what's been given to us, and that's the mission that's been given to us. I say that specifically now going back to the Latino Arts and Cultural Center. We do not. What we have is an estimate by a group of people that came up with an estimate of what it would take in their estimation uh, to make the, the, the church uh, a livable space as opposed to the Phoenix Art Center that's contiguous to it. The discussions that are going on, you are correct. You are correct. Do not have the same dollar consideration. On the other hand, I think that if the, if the recommendation is ultimately made, and I believe it will be, it will have a very general recommendation because engineering will be necessary, uh, design will be necessary, et cetera. And so those will be the initial funds with which to begin the process. It will also have, because I think we should recognize uh, that the kind of, uh, that the kind of cultural and art center that we're talking about and recommending, it's gonna require substantially greater, millions more than the, the $20 million that would be appropriate for design and art and architecture, uh, or to initiate that. Uh, there has to be, therefore, a plan to raise that money. And we believe that beginning with uh, the, the cloud of CPLC nationally uh, and with the kinds of uh, influence that we can bring to bear, uh, that it will be a pretty, uh, uh, um, uh, a pretty great program, a pretty real possibility for raising that, uh, that future amount of money. Uh, but it, this is, a beginning, as would be refurbishing that church, as, as offensive as I might find it, that they spent all this time and came up with something that's not culturally relevant to the Latino community that was here. Well, let me not get started about the history of Arizona and Phoenix and our role in it, but somehow the fellows who did all this missed all that. Uh, so, so if we're going to do as the chair has requested or has outlined, that we do not have to find specific places, then I think we can go forward with the, uh, with the uh, caveat that we are not tied to any one specific location. As to the amount of money, the, the, the projects taken in totality are about approximately $168 million over uh, the allowable $500 million cap. So if we're not going to be the appropriations committee that begins to cut down every dime, someone is. And I think the executive committee will probably take the first swipe at it, and then the budget committee of the city will then take the next swipe at it, and ultimately it will be pared down uh, to meet that $500 million, but I think uh, our role is to recommend the 
those prioritized uh, uh, programs that the city staff has brought before us. Not being a member of the City of Phoenix staff, I'm not an expert on this subject, but I'm um, looking to staff. The comments are, are correct, uh, well said, and that came out of a conversation around the detailed budget for projects that are being proposed. It sounds like we are asking for more information around the actual budget for these projects as proposed. Is that a possibility in time for our next meeting as one of our agenda items? Um, Madam Chair, just to make sure I'm on the same page. You're wanting the detailed budget of all the projects that have been discussed? Okay. For the ones that have been prioritized, again, we had to have factual information, so we have that information. We did ask the projects that you recommended for today's presentations, as you heard, to do a hurry-up process, um, which we can capture um, that information, and we'll work with those organizations because some of them did just submit um, really great estimates based off the information they could um, get. So we can work on those uh, prioritized budgets. And I apologize. I thought it was for the prioritized projects within the critical needs study. Are we wanting new projects as well? That's quite I think we have those. I mean, the uh, Jewish Historical Society has presented. Um, the Phoenix Center for the Arts has given us very detailed information. We don't have detailed information about the prioritized projects. We just have very generalized. And if there are estimates, for example, uh, Valley Youth Theater, I mean, they had $1.5 million in a 2001 bond that was for purchase of property. I don't know anything about that and what happened with that. I don't know if what is proposed, what is it, $14 million? How do they come up with that exactly? and is there an estimate that, um, that is done by a professional that actually verifies that that is accurate, that $14 million is what is needed. So I, I, I feel like I'm trying to make decisions without adequate information. Yes, yeah, so we have the backup information for all these, just like the throngs of materials that you have received from these organizations that back up their numbers. We do have that information. Um, we can either share it or... Um, I don't really know what a presentation would look like on all of that information, but we can share all the backup that was done on the prioritized projects. Maybe not a presentation, but an actu actually give the information, and if we have any questions, we can ask. Perfect. So let me attempt to summarize what I believe are our requests for our next meeting, and then I'll ask for additional comments from there. Uh, via email, prior to our next meeting, provide us uh, that detailed budget, that detailed list of expenditures for the projects discussed. For the culture facilities under that $10.1 million in the critical needs study, uh, detailed info expenditures for those as well. We discussed receiving a copy of the city's agreement with the Phoenix Center for the Arts via email. So those are the three items that I have captured. In terms of presentations or more information at our next meeting, uh, as requested by Sam, uh, more information about Super Bowl grant program. They do have a legacy grant program, uh, so if we could receive a little bit of information about that. And then I would add to that as well the Hans Park Partner Coalition to make the subcommittee aware of the private-public partnership that exists to uh, fundraise for the revitalization of Hans Park. Uh, one thing I would say, uh, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, the legacy grants are due <laughs> Monday at 4 o'clock. And so um, I know that there's been lots of information that has been out there, but we can present on it in two weeks, but the deadline would have come. So there, there is a legacy grant opportunity that is available, um, and, and we, can, we certainly have okay. sent it out to our uh, contacts, and we will conti continue to do that again. And I'll weekend. ask them to modify the request to send that information to us via email as soon as possible. Uh, hopefully it's just a, a forward of information a to yes, the, absolutely. the subcommittee. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'll move that to the, the email request. And then again, in terms of uh, more information at our next meeting, uh, a little bit of background on the Hans Park Partner Coalition, as I previously mentioned. We'd like the detailed facility condition assessment for the Phoenix Theater, for Phoenix Center for the Arts. We talked about the city's agreement being sent via email, um, but as part of the presentation, 
to learn about their North Building ask, uh, it would, I think, be prudent to summarize, again, the city's agreement with Phoenix Center for the Arts so that we understand the city's responsibilities as it pertains to that agreement. And then I, I'm hearing the words code, standard, up to code, up to standard. And I, I think being clear about what is not up to code versus what is not up to industry standards is really important for all of these projects we're discussing. Um, because again, it feels like the Arts Committee is really leading and we as a subcommittee have the opportunity to be a part of bringing accessibility and inclusion, representation, rem rem remembrance, equity through all these projects that we have uh, heard about today and that we learned about at our last meeting. So being very specific on the language used I think is also really important as we move through this project. Uh, I'll look to my subcommittee members to ask if there are any other requests I did not summarize or anything else to add. What about the Neighborhood Services Department and the ADA um, monies that they have? We need more information about what they're going to be, how they may be contributing, and also the Parks Department and what it intends to do about the Phoenix Center for the Arts, which is under their purview. I believe we discussed including that in our recommendation as part of our strategy when we're recommending our prioritized list to stress the need to look at funding from all three sources. Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, um, several of us, I, I, for example, am on the parks <laughs> um, also and also on the neighborhood. Um, so I'll, I'll work with those subcommittees to make sure that we do the things appropriately and, and have these discussions. I, I also thought that we were going to ask how did the Center for the Arts get to the state that it is in now? I think that can be addressed in the presentation that was requested okay. and also okay. through the agreement. We can combine those two together. You'll get a copy of the agreement and then we will talk about what the agreement is, what our responsibility is as a city and what the responsibility of the organization is that's um, running the facility. So I think we can address it through that. Good clarity, thank you. Anything else? Just a reminder again that at the conclusion of our next meeting, our goal will be to create our list of, of prioritized items, and then we, before the end of our fourth meeting, will identify the ranking for those prioritized items. Uh, and just to those who are still here with us uh, here with us today in person or online, a reminder that our next meeting is scheduled for September 16th at 9 a.m. For subcommittee members, please notify staff in advance if you have a conflict with this meeting. And then again, uh, the reminder of that Wednesday, September 14th meeting at 6 p.m., the Go GeoBond Executive Committee will be meeting in order to hear public comment and all um, items related to the, the bond program. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. can do is to um, sign up for a free home assessment from SRP. So we have a free home assessment program. We will come out to your house, look at your house from top to bottom, look at the things that um, could impact uh, your energy efficiency, and we give you um, free tips.